No, not yet. I'll do that tonight. I'll do it tonight and I'll... Recording in progress. Put a link. Well, I don't know. Where should I link it? Oh, no. Wait a minute. We don't need to link it, do we? What do you mean link it? Like share a link. Well, once you upload it, share the link to me. Well, yeah, to you. Like, but, like I was thinking in the forums or something. Well, no. I mean, you could, you can uh, just post it straight to your, your own uh, channel. And then I can cross post. And in fact, I see no reason why you wouldn't do that. You probably have at least a handful of people who watch your shit who do not watch my shit and mm -hmm. they care about what you post. They're interested in what you do. So it's like anything we do together, you can cross post. Cloud. But we are recording nice. on the, the Zoom side. Are we, are we recording on the OBS side? Okay, well, what's up, everybody? Welcome to Theory Underground. I am your host, David McCarricker, and we are joined today by a uh, co-host. It is Nance, 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 ba -ba -ba -ba, in the house. What's up, man? Welcome. Ba -ba -ba -ba. What's crack a like in? We don't give a fuck. We don't, give a, we don't fuck. give a fuck. Google just is talking to me. She thought I was talking to her. She said, co-host, it is Na Nance Dance in the house. What's up, man? Welcome. Fucking Google. did not... I did not activate her on purpose. All right, so, so this is the second half of Andre Gorz's what? Farewell, Farewell to the working class: an essay on post-industrial socialism. Working class, what's up? Uh, well, I mean, if you've watched this far, then you already know what's up. But I wanted to reintroduce it because we might post as two separate halves, and also just because. It is a different half of the day. I spent the first half of the day uh, multitasking, listening. I was super into it. Nance was reading most of it. It was fucking awesome. But I was multitasking because I was first washing the dishes and second of all, setting up this space. And the first half of the day was really good. And then it just kind of went to shit as I realized not only is this laptop a piece of shit that is broken, like a CPU fan is going out and it's SSD is functioning between 0% and like 3% like, uh, on average and it's not supposed to be doing that, it's supposed to be a lot higher. And so it's like, like this is a problem. No, not only that, I find out my, my actual computer here is toasted. It, my OS was there at one minute, Windows, the operating system, the OS, was there and then it just was gone. Wanted me to, you know, start it from a boot log or whatever, or from a from a boot drive. I mean, anyway. So I, I, I uh, well, I was very frustrated, so I took a nap. nap. And uh, then I come back, back and Nance is having nothing but problems of his own on his computer after getting his updates. What had happened? Shut shut out of your screen. screen. Yeah, one of my monitors stopped working, which is now working again and i don't know why um and now just everything is fucked like everything is all fucked so yeah so, I don't, well, we're we're we got attacked by some leaders we think some people put a spell on us we now believe with witchcraft so don't don't put hexes on us or we'll do it back to you we're gonna do a lot of ccr review readings this week and we're gonna learn how to, how to counteract this so, so. Anyway, uh, no, let's let's get serious though. It's time for chapter four. Workers power. Actually, that's a question. Workers power. Is that how you think Gore's meant to say it, or how would how would you how do you think Gore's would read this aloud? Yeah, like uh, workers power. Workers yeah. power. Yeah. 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 All right. All right. Well, I'll, I'll take it away. Sooner or later, according to Marx's theory, the proletariat is to become conscious of its being as the labor power and the collective productive worker. According to Marx, this means that it embodies humanity's capacity to produce very much more than what it requires for subsistence. Right, right. We 
create so much more than we need to survive. Poor Marx lies in the essence of the productive power of the proletariat, which will be capable of producing more than the mere necessities of life. It is inherently capable of producing a surplus and supplying quantities of surplus labor uncalled for by any natural necessity or overriding need. Thus, it foreshadows the future advent beyond the realm of necessity of the reign of freedom in which work will be an end in itself. Its goals and products will transcend the vital necessities and will reveal to the producer, the worker, her or his potentially sovereign creativeness. The contradiction will then become intolerable between the purpose of work, which is the produce, which is to produce the non-necessary, and the condition of the, of the proletarians who remain prisoners of the sphere of the necessity by having to sell their labor power for a mere subsistence wage. Sooner or later, the proletariat must come to recognize that it holds the key to the realm of freedom in its own hands. For freedom to reign, all that is needed is for proletarians to unite and to take the immense productive force of industry under their control. This moment of revolutionary consciousness will be hastened by the ever more serious crises experienced by an exploitative system which pays a subsistence wage to the producers of a growing surplus. In fact, the moment of revolutionary consciousness did not materialize as expected. With the exception of certain limited sections of the class and on limited occasions, the proletariat has not and does not perceive itself as a sovereign agent of the free creation of wealth. The contradiction between its subjugation to the realm of necessity and the fact that this sphere has already been transcended by the gratuit the gratuitous the gratuitousness the non-necessity, the non-utility of the wealth produced has not been as widely recognized as, in theory, it should have been. Okay, that was a big clunky sentence. The contradiction between its subjugation to the realm of necessity and the fact that this sphere has already been transcended by the non-necessity of the wealth produced has not been as widely recognized as, in theory, it should have been. Okay, well, who cares, though? I mean that's that shouldn't that shouldn't be a a problem. He, of course, he's not saying that it is necessarily. The reason may be found in the fact that the bourgeoisie succeeded in destroying at root what consciousness the proletariat might have had of its sovereign creativeness. For this purpose, 18th century bosses and present day scientific management have been applying the same recipe. They organized the work process in such a way as to make it impossible for the worker to experience work as a potentially creative activity. The fragmentation of work, Taylorism, scientific management, and finally automation have succeeded in abolishing the trades and the skilled workers whose pride in a job well done was indicative of a certain consciousness of their practical sovereignty. Um, I'm going to go ahead and take this part. Um, the reason we found the bourgeoisie I'll just put it right here. The bourgeoisie succeeded in destroying the root, at root, what consciousness the proletariat might have had of its sovereign creativeness. For this purpose, 18th century bosses and present day scientific management have been applying the same recipe. They organized the work process in such a way as to make it impossible for the worker to experience work as a potentially creative activity. Yeah, and it's, you just don't feel ownership for your work the same way, right? Because of Taylorization. That and when you so, spend all day long making meaningless bullshit, you can't take pride in it. Like when, when you hate the product you're producing, hard to take pride in it. Yeah. What, what, why is it starting it? What, why, what is it doing? the of the wealth produced what what, what part? that's from like the well, uh, above portion i don't actually know, dude this is fucking this this, is this this ocr of this text is really bad it's not letting me yeah it's very bad dude whatever i'll keep reading 
the idea of a subject class of United. So basically all it's saying though, is everything we've been saying for the last several months about the PMC, the creation of the PMC through tailorization and why that was done. And it looks like he's aware of this by, by saying that, yeah, that this was rolled out as a way to fragment labor so as to make it something people don't want to own, right? Or even like, even if they want to, it's like they can't. The idea of a subject class of United producers capable of seizing power had been specific to these skilled workers proud of their trade. To them, power was not something abstract, but a matter of daily experience. On the factory floor, power was theirs. They ruled over production. Their irreplaceable skills and practical know-how placed them at the top of a factory hierarchy that was the inverse of the social hierarchy. The boss, the chief engineer, and the inspectors alike depended upon the know-how of the skilled worker, which was complementary and often superior to theirs. They had to rely on the worker's cooperation and advice to win the respect and loyalty, whereas the skilled workers themselves needed neither the boss nor the office, officers of production to perform their work. Like I, I've worked like 25 jobs where I, I yeah, I was not there. The, the, it's not like your coworkers or even yourself, like that you're supposed to really uh, be able to contribute in that sort of way where it's like, no, they actually also depend on your knowledge, right? Like most jobs I've worked in, most of my coworkers, the managers do not depend on our knowledge. They tell us what to do and we do it. Yeah. And we might be a little inventive. We might skirt things in a certain way or whatever. We might put our own little spin on it, but no, they, they, you are replaceable. I've always been replaceable at jobs, you know? So that's what he's getting to. Thus there existed a practical and technical form of workers power on the factory floor a power parallel to the economic and social power of capital, capable of opposing the latter and even of contemplating its overthrow. It was not the power of every worker, nor that of the collective worker. It was the power of skilled workers who, helped and assisted by unskilled workers and laborers, stood at the top of a specifically working class hierarchy, which was distinct from and which competed with the broader social hierarchy. There was a working class culture, tradition, and ethic with its own mor morality and scale of values. Those at the top of the working class hierarchy asked nothing of the bourgeois world. Instead, they were the representatives of a specific culture, able to confront their bourgeois counterparts as equals and prepared to cooperate with them in production only to the extent that the bourgeois, the bourgeois bosses were prepared to reciprocate by recognizing workers' supremacy and sovereignty in the sphere they effectively controlled. There is a footnote on that. Uh, I think I'll read it. It's a big one. The quality and speed of German industrial development is in large measure the result of the relationship subsequently termed paternalistic German employers were able to establish with skilled workers. It was the worth it, it would be worth studying the different histories of the French, British, and German working class movements from this point of view. Having been co-opted by employers from the outset, German skilled workers tended, to a greater degree than anywhere else, to take on the role of officers and junior officers of production. As a result, anarcho-syndicalism did not develop as considerably in Germany as it did in France, while mass unionism, based on unskilled workers and laborers, and geared towards a more stable framework of institutional negotiation, developed sooner and more rapidly. You're going to get me yawning doing that. I know, dude. Oh, boy. I think it's going to hit me. We're all just going to fall asleep here. We're all going to die. We play, I, I wish we could play music in the background, for real. Like, just anything we wanted to. Like, have a playlist going. But... We'll figure out how to eventually. There is a way to to run an audio track that everyone can hear but isn't being recorded on the VOD or the VOD. Yeah. There's a way to do that on uh, Twitch. That way we can play whatever we want. But anyway, for right now, it's just quiet and then I hear you yawning and now I want to go to sleep. We need to do some jumping jacks. Well, it's only 7.33 where I'm at. I'm, I've got... 
hours in me still, but all these notions were implicit in the slogan, all factories to the workers. It was the exact counterpart to an old, to, do you think this is true? What he said so far? Like, do you know? I, cause I mean, I think it's true, but I don't know. I, I guess I just wasn't there. Was there really like this power relationship where it's like skill actually gave the skilled worker like this sort of standing? I mean, that made them have to bargain. Like, I don't know. I just don't know enough. I mean, I've had some jobs where, like, like when I was fabricating trailers. Like, that was, like, semi-skilled. I mean, it was any dumb fucker can figure out how to use a welder. But over time, when you get really good at it and you figure out your own method and your own shortcuts and all this, you do have leverage over the boss in a way. And, and you can, like, say, no, I want this. No, I want that. No, I'm doing it this way. No, I'm doing it that way. So I can imagine... That it would work that way when all the workers were more skilled. A lot more. Yeah. Right, right, right. Uh, but I mean, ultimately, it was still like you didn't have freedom. You just had a little more wiggle room. Like, I, I, yeah. I don't know. It makes it sound like it was like, like. Like these guys had a lot of power. And it's like Well, I mean, compared to to workers of today, they they had a lot more power. Um, but it was I I wouldn't call it real power. I would just call it like wiggle room. I mean, if we're talking like a blacksmith, like, you know, six hundred years ago, yeah, that dude's got a lot of say over his situation. Like obviously almost total say. Yeah. Right. Like, like he still has to pay uh, a tax. He still has to pay a tithe, but he, it's his show. Yeah. Right. And it's just like, huh? So, I mean, I just don't know about like at Marx's time, what it was like compared to what it was like at say Barbara Ehrenreich's time. I don't actually know as much about that as, I, and it looks like he wants to, he's basically saying it would be interesting for people to do this history. And it's like, are you saying you haven't done it and you're just telling us how it was at the time? <laughs> like, I always just hear, this is how I hear history. You know, I, I'm like, what? But anyway, okay. All these notions were implicit, implicit in the slogan, all factories to the workers. It was the exact counterpart to an older demand, all land to the peasants. Hmm. In the eyes of the anarcho syndicalist workers of the 19th and early 20th centuries, there was a similarity between the land, which peasants cultivated and struggled over, with a parasitical sinereal class and the factory which workers set to work and struggled over with a parasitical and equally idle capitalist class. In retrospect, what is striking about this slogan is the light it throws upon the identification of workers with their work and their factory. Oppression was not as yet seen as something intrinsic to factory work itself, in theory, it seemed possible then for workers to take possession of the means of production and subordinate and subordinate them to their purposes without calling into question the nature either of what was produced or what or what continued to be perceived as their work. Can you can you take it from for for a little bit? I gotta step away for a second. Yeah. Their work and their factory. Oppression was not as yet seen as something intrinsic to factory work itself. In theory, it seemed possible then for workers to take possession of the means of production and subordinate them to their purposes without calling into question the nature either of what was produced or of what continued to be perceived as their work. As Adriano Sofri has shown, the movement for factory councils in the early 1920s can be seen as the most advanced expression of a class of workers that felt itself able to exercise unmediated power over production and to extend this power to society as a whole. Since workers were able to run the factories, they could equally run society. 
This was the basic premise and experience informing the concept of factory councils as the permanent organs of workers' power. It was a premise grounded upon an assumption which has subsequently disappeared. This consisted of, of the belief that the social process of production was as transparent and intelligible as the labor process that existed in each workshop and factory. Mastery of the latter would entail mastery of the former. Hence, the site of production was also the site of power. None of this remains true nowadays, if it ever has been. Firstly, as we have seen, it is no longer possible to regard the factory as an economic unit. It has become a productive unit integrated with other productive units often long distances away, dependent upon a centralized management coordinating dozens of productive units for its supplies, outlets, product lines, etc. In other words, the sites of production are no longer the sites of decision-making and economic power. The social process of production has become opaque, and this opacity has come to affect the work process in every technical unit. The final destination and even the very nature of what is produced remains unknown. Apart from management, nobody knows exactly what the things being produced are for, and in any event, nobody gives a toss. The same process of technical specialization and economic concentration that has destroyed the autonomy of the productive unit has also destroyed those trades which were the source of workers' autonomy. Instead of a hierarchy and an, and an order in production defined by workers, Taylorism made it possible to impose a hierarchy and order defined by the factory management. Skilled workers were eliminated after bitter conflict and replaced by petty officers of production who, although of proletarian origin, formed part of the managerial hierarchy. They were chosen and trained by management and invested by it with disciplinary and police powers. Production work was henceforth carried out by an atomized mass of workers divested of autonomy and technical power. The notion of taking power over production is a meaningless one as far as this mass of workers is concerned, at least in the case of the factory as it is. Workers' councils, which were hey. the org... Yeah. Here, I'm going to let you screen share. Because I can't find where it's at. And when I did a word search, it uh, took me to the wrong spot on the page. Like, actually, can you see this? Look at that. I typed in chosen and trained because you read that. And it takes me to a section that says, and invested by it. So yeah, that's that means the... O the OCR is that bad. Like, it's actually, like, off or something. Yeah, it's off by, like, six words. Because they were chosen and trained by management and invested by it with disciplinary and police powers. Same line, it's just, like, off. Oh, it is the same line. It's just a few words off. Oh, I yeah. thought it was way off. Okay. No. Cool. Okay. Well, do, should, should I stop screen sharing, though, and let you? Uh, No, it's fine. Are you able to show on the recording side the the one you're looking at right now? Yeah, in a minute. Hold on. Yeah, I just covered. Otherwise, up. I have to because uh, otherwise I have to sit here and scroll the whole time. I just covered up your yours. Okay, based. with mine. So you good. Can, yeah. All right, perfect. Nice. Okay, good. Trying to set up, trying to set up my speaker in here so that I don't have to use these headphones while I'm doing stuff. Dude, what the fuck is going? Hold on. Well, everybody, I guess I should take a moment to make a quick plug for the website, the app, the store, the donations that you can give, the ways that you can get involved. There's four tiers of there's four tiers that you can subscribe to in the app. Each one unlocks key parts of the experience of the weekly hub events of past, current, and future courses as well as a ton of other things. Anything in particular that we should touch on, you think, Nance? Um, no. The 
No. The uh streaming shit that we'll that we'll be doing soon. I don't think we need to start talking about that yet, but stay tuned everybody. Roll, we're gonna be doing some cool shit with that, yeah. Um well, but you know, it'll basically be a, a continuation and extension upgrade of the hub events that we've been doing. And so um there'll just be various levels of engagement, uh levels that you can get into. Um, and so basically just stay tuned for that. Yeah. But um, I got my my speaker set up here. I think I'm ready to switch it over if you wanna take it away. All right. An invested by it with disciplinary police powers production work was henceforth carried out by an atomized mass of workers divested of autonomy and technical power. The notion of taking power over production is a meaningless one as far as this mass of workers is concerned. At least in the case of the factory as it is, workers' councils, which were the organs of working class power when production was carried out by technically autonomous teams of workers, have become anachronistic in the giant factory of assembly lines and self-contained departments. The only imaginable form of workers' power now is the power to control and veto, the power to refuse certain conditions and types of work, to define acceptable, to define acceptable norms and enforce respect for those norms upon the managerial hierarchy. It is obvious, however, that this type of power is of a negative and subordinate sort. It exists within the framework of capitalist relations of production over a labor process defined in general, if not in detail, by management. It places limits upon the power of management, but does not present it with any autonomous form of workers' power. This is why, as has been the case in Italy, attempts to establish councils at the level of the shop or line, as the expression of grassroots workers' power, have usually resulted in their rapid reintegration into the trade union structure and their institutionalization as negotiating and bargaining forums. It is difficult to see how things could be otherwise. The grassroots workers' council has no power over the product or the process of production as a whole. What it produces is a mere component, carefully planned and predetermined by a design staff of the whole factory's or group's output. The process of producing this component has been equally carefully planned and predetermined in the design of the special machines that have usually been preset in order to deprive workers of the freedom to adjust them or take initiatives. Workers or work groups are in no position to put these machines or their products to any autonomous use. Their margin of autonomy amounts to challenging the organization and speed of the required operations, the number and length of breaks, the size of work groups, and the length of the working day. These have become the variables upon which workers' demands are now centered. This is not to say they are the most important variables in the eyes of workers. They are merely the only ones that allow some room for the expression of autonomous initiatives by work groups, the only ones that make it possible to assert some power. In both France and Italy, there is ample evidence that the assertion of power matters more to workers than the qualitative improvements to which it might give rise. In a typical strike in the Jaeger factories in Kane in 1972, for example, initial demands centered upon the right of working women to set themselves the speed of work. But when they were provisionally granted the right to work at their natural speed, they rapidly discovered that our natural speed is not to work at all at least under existing social and technical conditions. The same thing happened in Fiat, at Fiat in Turin, when workers there were granted the right to establish councils, representing each district work group, distinct work group, and elect stewards in order to control those va variables within their power. In many cases, they continued to call into question the norms that they themselves had fixed and negotiated with management. It is clear that once a norm has been decided upon by workers and accepted by management, it becomes no more than a new form of imprisonment for the workers themselves. It matters little whether it is any the more bearable physically or psychologically. Once it has been recognized and ratified by management, it no longer expresses the autonomous power of the work group, but reflects the constricting power of the managerial hierarchy. In any event... <sighs> 
The latter cannot grant any real power to work groups, even over the variables they control. Factories can only work if the outputs of the various lines, workshops, and teams are coordinated and regular. Although buffer stocks may allow some flexibility in the speed of work, they do not make for complete elasticity. This is why management, whatever the type of ownership of a factory, in exchange for granting the right to self-determination, expects work groups to adhere to the norms they might define. Oh, what the fuck? Hold on. And the stewards become responsible to management for ensuring that the undertaking will be respected. Hence, the stewards, in the workers' eyes and in their own, are transformed into representatives of management. If they refuse the role of enjoining workers to respect their undertakings, they will no longer be recognized by management as representatives of the grassroots. They will be unable to go back to negotiate on future occasions. There will be no other way open to them than to resign. This indeed is what the majority of those elected to represent workers' autonomy chose to do. Those who did not resign became ordinary trade union officials mediating institutionally between grassroots aspirations and the overriding imperatives of the productive machine. Imperatives represented but not invented by management. Grassroots workers' power can thus be seen to be a material impossibility within the framework of the existing structure of production. All that is actually possible is the power of trade unions. That is the power of the institutional apparatus to which workers delegate representative power. Trade union power is not, however, the same thing as workers' power, any more than the power of parliament is the power of the sovereign people. Unions possess power as institutions that are relatively autonomous from their mandators. They become autonomous as a result of the mediatory power conferred upon them by their institutional role. There is no point in reproving individual trade unionists for this fact. They sometimes experience the contradiction as a source of anguish or misery. Not they individually are at fault, but the technical and social division of labor, the mode and relations of production, the size and inertia of the industrial machine, which, because they rigidly predetermine both the results and the phases of the work process, leave no more than marginal space for workers' control in and over production. If workers' control is to exist, it is therefore necessary to go about enlarging this space. This is hardly a small matter. For the obstacle standing in the way of workers' control, power and autonomy is not merely legal or institutional. It is also a material obstacle which derives from the design, size, and functioning of factories. It ultimately derives from the collective capitalist responsible for the management of all factories. For the great secret of large-scale industry, as of any vast bureaucratic or military machine, is that nobody holds power. Power in such organisms does not have a subject. It is not the property of individuals freely defining the rules and goals of their collective actions. Instead, all that can be found from the bottom right up to the top of an industrial or administrative hierarchy are agents obeying the categorical imperatives and inertias of the material system they serve. The personal power of capitalists, directors, and managers of every kind is an optical illusion. It is a power that exists only in the eyes of those lower down the hierarchy who receive orders from those above and are personally at their mercy. In fact, those above are not the sovereign authors of the orders they give. They too are no more than mere agents. There is a higher law for, for whose formulation no one in particular is responsible, which they are bound to obey or go to their doom. Its terms consist of injunctions like capital must grow, orders must come in, competitors must be eliminated, machines must be kept working, more, quicker, bigger, cheaper. These are the laws of capital. Marx described capitalists as functionaries of capital. At once oppressors and alienated, they have to submit to and uphold what appears to be a law beyond their power. They administer the workings of capital. They do not control them. They do not possess power. Rather, they are possessed by it. Power is not a subject. It is a system of relationships, a structure. It is managed, not owned, by the collective capitalist. And this fact, this infinite dilution of power within the order of things, 
endows those who are its agents with their legitimacy. Thus, at any moment, any one of them may say, I'm not doing this because I want to, but because I have to. It's not personal, it's business, baby. I am not carrying out my free will, but submitting to the iron law of necessity. I don't make the rules, I just obey them, like all of us. If you know of any other way to run this firm, tell me, and you can have my place. All modern forms of power are of this type. They have no subject. They are not born or assumed by any sovereign claiming to be the source of law, of all law, and the basis of all legitimacy. In the modern state, there are no rulers enforcing obedience by virtue of command or requiring allegiance and submission to their person. In the modern state, the bearers of power enforce obedience in the name of objective necessities for which no one can be held responsible. Contemporary technocratic power has an essentially functional legitimacy. It does not belong to an individual subject, but to a function, to the place occupied by an individual within the organogram of a firm, an institution, or the state. The particular individuals holding this or that functional position are always contingent, can always be called into question. They have no majesty or moral authority. Malicious gossips circulate on their account. People laugh behind their backs, since, as individuals, the holders of public positions are no better than anyone else, and can be replaced from one day to the next. Power neither belongs to them nor emanates from them. It is an effect of the system. It is the result of the structure of a material system of relationships in which a law appearing to govern things subjugates people through the mediation of other people. It matters little here whether this type of material system was established deliberately to create this sort of subjugation. What is important is that the latter cannot be abolished without the abolition of the former. The industrial system as we know it results in subjugation to the giant technical and bureaucratic machines and in the power of capital through the mediation of its functionaries. Eliminating the latter without eliminating the former in its totality would amount to no more than the substitution of one bourgeoisie for another. Chapter 5. Personal Power and Functional Power the working class movement has known from its early beginnings that there is a difference between personal and functional power. The former reflects a person's superior capacity and knowledge, whatever he, whatever her or his hierarchical position. A skilled worker, for instance, can direct unskilled laborers because of superior know-how and feels entitled to the acknowledgement of this superiority. Anarcho-syndicalism went hand-in-hand hand with a corporatist mentality and a sense of trade-based elitism. On the other hand, anarcho-syndicalist workers challenged the power of their bosses, which was derived not from superior know-how, but merely from the dominant position conf conferred by law in the framework of social relations upon the legal owners of capital. Any fool could become a boss by inheriting a business, a fortune, and the name or title to which legal rights, a social position, and a place within the inst institutional hierarchy were attached. While fighting the capitalist bosses as a class and as a function, anarcho-syndicalists did not refuse to reach an understanding with certain Schumpterian entrepreneurs, typified by the self-made man with a passion for technical prowess and appreciation of work well done. The personal power of this type of entrepreneur was, to a large extent, based upon ability to convince his workers of his superior technical competence within his own field, and hence to create a sense of shared commitment among all those who had capability and a willingness to make the enterprise a success. Class antagonism has often been superseded by this type of relationship between skilled workers and the personal power of visionary entrepreneurs. It is because they were passionately personal that the goals of the Schumpterian entrepreneur could, be tran could transcend class barriers and be accepted or even shared by the workers. The worst form of power is not, then, the personal power of a leader or a head imposing sovereign will upon others and expecting them to pursue aims which the leader alone has freely chosen. This type of personal power implies a certain sort of risk. By setting forth a specifically personal project and by taking full responsibility for her or his actions, self-made on entrepreneurs necessarily run the risk of being challenged. They are likely to be admired or detested 
according to their success or failure in getting those over whom they have authority to share their goals. They work without legal protection or even legitimacy, saying, I want, makes it impossible for them to take refuge behind overriding external necessity or impersonal forces. Since the entrepreneur's power is that of a subject person, it can be opposed, called into question, even rejected by those under command. The exercise of personal power necessarily implies an acceptance of the most direct personal forms of conflict. The act of asserting one's own will carries the risk that others will respond by asserting theirs. Consequently, Schumpeterian types of entrepreneur and visionary industrial pioneers tend to live in an atmosphere of passion and drama. Their relationships with their immediate entourage are often intensely emotional. All the parties involved are aware that they may meet total defeat, although obviously class relations. None of those involved in them behaves entirely in accordance with the legal and institutional rules informing the relationship. The personal power of the boss may be destroyed, bringing down the whole enterprise. Doubtless other enterprises will take its place, in which the power of capital rests upon a less fragile basis than the personal authority of an entrepreneur. But what sort of basis might this be? The foundation of the legitimacy of power is one of the great unresolved questions of capitalist society. According to its own ideology, the most able should always have unrestricted access to the positions of power. Liberal ideology implies a meritocracy, and this, in turn, since individual capacities and abilities are by nature untransmissible and personal, presupposes complete fluidity in relation to power. No material or institutional inertia must frustrate social mobility. Yesterday's winner must be liable to be displaced today by whoever shows greater ability. Employers and workers, bankers and peasants, must be able to permute their respective social positions constantly. Liberal ideology assumes that success in business never provides the victors with the means to preserve their own power. If free enterprise and competition are to prevail... The power derived from success in business must not imply the power to block the ascent to newcomers and to transmit to heirs or delegate to trustees the prerogatives and privileges one has won. This ideal vision of a society of free and equal citizens might have contained a germ of truth during the heroic age of capitalism, which was also the age of colonization of the colonization of North America. It presupposed practically unlimited opportunities for enterprise and success and implied that no one would be barred from succeeding by those who were successful before. Stating this presupposition makes it obvious that it could only come true in exceptional circumstances and for a limited duration. There are only so many positions of power at any moment in any given society. Further, and despite the implicit assumptions of liberal ideology, there are no forms of power which are not, in essence, also the power to secure and delegate. Power, by definition, is an appropriation of a position of domination, and such positions are necessarily pri privileged and scarce. Any occupant of such a position necessarily denies it to others. It follows that the only politically important question is this. Was the position of domination created by its occupant, and is the power which it confers destined to disappear along with the individual? Or, on the other hand, is power inherent in the pre-existing position occupied by its holder within a system of social relations, and is it, as a result, independent of the individual occupying it? As a society ages, and this is particularly true of capitalist society, positions of power and the modalities by which they are exercised tend to become increasingly, and in the last analysis completely, predetermined. Every position, and all the personal qualities associated with it, come to be predefined. Hence, no one, however audacious, will be allowed to succeed outside the customary channels or the established institutions. Power will never be exercised by individuals or depend exclusively upon their personal authority. Comes to be, it comes to be exercised through institutions, following predetermined procedures, and those responsible for its exercise are themselves no more than the servants of an apparatus of domination. A machine, as the Americans put it, or the establishment, as it is known in Britain. They impersonate an impersonal and transcendent power. 
This institutional sclerosis is inseparable from the bureaucrat bureaucratization of power. No one is allowed to conquer power by and for her or himself. All she or he can do is to rise to one of the positions conferring a modicum of power on its holders. Consequently, it's no longer people who have power, it's the positions of power which have their people. Hmm. These positions are no longer tailored by powerful individualities to fit and exalt their ego. Instead, they tailor the individuals to make them fit their function. Such a society leaves no room for adventurers, chumptarian entrepreneurs, or conquerors. Success belongs to careerists, to those who have followed the paths and attended the schools that equip them with a personality, accent, manners, and social skills fitting the functions that look for people to fill them. This development, I, I, yeah. this development, yeah, I can take it here. Cool. cool. <clears throat> this development was already preordained from the moment when the individual capitalist gave away the joint stock company, the entrepreneur of the bank, and the boss to capital and its functionaries, otherwise known as managers. The whole machinery of economic and political decision making and management has come to be structured in a way that meets the requirements of the profitability and circulation of capital. The logic of capital must no longer be dependent upon the personal skills and initiatives of its servants. It must prevail whatever the abilities and individual authority of its functionaries. Naturally, the same situation is true of the mechanisms of political power. They are called upon to exercise power over people without allowing anyone in particular to exercise it in any personal sense. The state might be defined as a mechanism of power to which every citizen is subordinated and which at the same time denies personal power to everyone. This type of society finds its fullest expression in the figure of the bureaucrat. Bureaucrats guarantee the power of the state without possessing any power themselves. As agents of power or fragments of power, they maintain the mechanisms of domination by enforcing rules for which they have no responsibility and by fulfilling functions with which they can have no personal identification. The power of bureaucrats varies inversely with their impotence. They uphold the integrity of the administrative machine by renouncing all power for themselves. They are the cogs of a well-defined machine, the instruments of a power exercised without a subjective will behind it. In the state apparatus, as in the giant firm, power is an or or organogram, an organogram. When I listened to this before, I was like, what is that word? An organogram. I actually want to look up that really quick. I mean, I get the word organ in in, in the sense of like an organization, you know, an organ of an organization, but what is the igram? Oh, and are, am, am I screen sharing on the recording? It says, Tableau schematic des diverses parties. De it, wait, it's just in French. Oh, it's an organization chart. Okay, it's oh. an organization chart. This oh. is a French word for organization uh, chart. So power is an organization chart. Hmm. Okay. Now, this this whole section is on the one side why you can't just throw out Burnham or the leftist version of that through Ehrenreich. Right, like you, and it's also on the other side why actual new left. Oh, let's do the march through the institutions, identity politics. Um, it's just about representation and recognition within these institutions. Why all of this, both new left, old left, miss the point. And this is why we are already at. You were saying this earlier. Something you liked about what Gores was doing is he's really kind of showing why. It is already a dumb machine and that like AI is already real. This is AI. When people start calling chat GBT and, you know, mid journey or, or, or Dolly or whatever, when they start calling that uh, AI, it's like, okay, now we're fetishizing AI. AI is already the system itself. And so when people are saying things like there's still a public, there's still you know newspapers there's still um uh 
militias and working class schools and uh, infantry still matters as much as it does, as opposed to all of the more highly specialized forms of um, mechanized violence today. Um, it's like you're talking to people who really are just kind of like stuck in like a, a history book and they're not like, they, there's an update that they kind of don't want to get. And I'm like, is Andre Gorse like the update that they're like avoiding or that someone has been hiding from them? Cause I feel like they've been hiding it from us. So it's like, this is really fucking good. It also shows why Foucault does matter. Mm. Right. This is like, mm. this is like the best contextualization of Foucault that I've ever seen. Um, just as a, a perspective into this, but I think Weber also Habermas too. Like there are these, they, and, and, you know, and, and Bordeaux really sociology itself as a, a like post-Marxist sociology um, kind of functions in on this bureaucratic side of things. Right. Which is why I don't think it would have made a difference if Trotsky had gotten in instead of Stalin, you know, so like Trotsky blames, you know, the personalities involved, he blames the bureaucracy uh, and the corruption of it, but it's like, no, it's a, it's a medium itself. It's a medium that shakes, shapes the messengers and the messages, right? So it's like, I don't know. I think the same thing would have happened to him, but um, I'll continue. It has been rightly said that the organogram organization chart was invented in order to produce more or less automatic obedience to the imperatives of the hierarchy. It was conceived by those technicians of power known as operational researchers or occasionally by lawyers. Its object is to preordain the working of a system by breaking it down into narrowly specialized functions and predefining the points of lateral and vertical junction between the specialized tasks. A network of functions, checks, and coordinations regulates the circulation of fragmentary information and, de and decisions, defines limited powers designed to balance and exclude one another in such a way as to prevent any individual or group from occupying a position of supremacy. Although an organogram may be the creation of a single individual, this does not mean that it can be seen as a materialization of that that individual's power a management consultant or specialist of constitutional law has no more personal power than any other functionary they merely specialize in devising forms of domination over everyone implemented through the non-power of each the elimination of personal power to the benefit of the functional power inherent in an anonymous organogram has profoundly changed the implications of class conflict Power in both society and the firm is now exercised by people who do not hold it, who are not personally answerable for their actions and take refuge behind the functions which answer for them. Since they are executants or servants, bureaucrats are never responsible. The predefined obligations inherent in their function relieve them of all personal responsibility and decision and enable them to meet protests with the disarming reply, we haven't chosen to do this. We're only enforcing the regulations. We're carrying out orders. Whose orders? Whose regulations? One could go back indefinitely up this hierarchy and it would still be impossible to find anyone else to say mine. However obvious the class character of the system of domination, it, it does not follow that the individuals making up the dominant class are exercising domination individually. They too are dominated by the very power they exercise. The subject of this power is untraceable, which is why the dominated masses tend implicitly to call for a sovereign whom they could hold responsible and to whom they could present their demands or appeals. Think of the slogans of mass demonstrations and the litany of chants directed at, na at named individuals, de Gaulle or Giscard, Wilson or Thatcher. Uh, and then he says, for example, the milk snatcher. And I would just say also just like think how punk largely comes about against Reagan. That was Reagan and Thatcher. Reagan and Thatcher. Right. <clears throat> the trap is obvious. Ascribing the effects of a system to a supposed sovereignty held personally responsible for its shortcomings leads to expecting salvation from a real leader willing to take personal responsibility for making matters change. 
This type of appeal to a prestigious figurehead or savior against the effects of bureaucratic domination is not limited to the petty bourgeoisie. When an oppressed mass finds itself without the practical or theoretical means to fight an illegitimate system of domination, recourse to the personal power of a prestigious leader may seem a desirable course to follow. This is my favorite like time that a person's ever kind of brought in, you know, what this whole element of cult of personality and tyranny or dictatorship or um like this is my this is probably the best way to bring it in and and to say that yeah this is the basis for fascism is the fact that people are under a corrupt system and no one is responsible and if you read hitler's mein kampf he says basically all this he says look nobody's responsible everybody says oh it's somebody else oh it's somebody else and the the, the bug never stops at anybody well guess what everybody i'll do it it's my mission to do it for the sake of germany right like it's it's just straight up what gores is describing here like so what he's been describing there's also like a good way of thinking about how maybe the best critique of the pmc as referring to a class or to individuals is that the point is is that there are no individuals there is no class i like the way that he does say that intellectual laborers are not part of a class or part of a non-class they can't identify with this thing and so it's like that's why it's like so hard for a person to be like to think about the pmcs because they're like uh-uh like they're they, they have no ownership over what they are a part of and when no one has any ownership over what they are a part of that just means that we're super fucking alienated right then you could add into that structural stultification, functional literacy, and the fact in what structural stultification really means is broken down families, neighborhoods, communities. Um, and so when you don't have your time energy, no one else has it. It's like you can't have civic infrastructure or organic networks, right? Like that shit breaks down. And that creates the conditions for fascism. So anyway, when he said he says, when an oppressed mass finds itself without the practical or theoretical means to fight an illegitimate system of domination, recourse to the personal power of a prestigious leader may seem a desirable course to follow by the mere fact of announcing, this is my decision. This is my will. These are my orders. The leader may deliver the people from the glue of serial impotence in contradistinction to a system based upon the evasion of responsibility, anonymous bureaucracies and impotent petty tyrants exercising a nameless power and complaining endlessly that they don't do what they want and do not want what they are doing, a leader or fearer is first and foremost that grand individual willing to say, I, power, all power is with this leader who will answer personally for his or her doings. The leader will be the solace and salvation of all those vainly seeking to bring to account the people responsible for their humiliations. He or she will identify and indict, indict the culprits. It's pus, pusillanic. Can you say that word? Is that a French word? Pusillanimous. I can't hear you. Pusillanimous. Oh, there Oh, you, it's not, so it's not some fancy, maybe pusillanimous. All right. It's pusillanimous and selfish petty bourgeois. It's plutocrats and sinister cosmopolitans who behind the scenes weave their occult web of price fixing, bribery, and secret international maneuver. It's the corrupt and discredited politicians willing to prostitute themselves to a ruling class, only too willing to set its blighted interests above those of the nation. The rhetoric is familiar. People awake, heed the call of the Fuhrer, whose grand design will sweep away the miserable projects of the bourgeoisie, who will free you from an oppressive system created by no one, for whose existence no one takes responsibility, who will impose personal power upon history and replace the mysterious laws governing the order of things by fiat. Henceforth, everything that is done will be done by the Fuhrer's will. Lead, Fuhrer, we will follow and recover our humanity and grandeur through the act of obedience." Fidelity to the idea, fidelity to the event. Such is the language of fascism. It has a capacity to transcend class division and draw upon the frustrated needs generated by a system of impersonal domination based upon the impotence of each and all. An indispensable condition for the emergence of fascism is the existence of a leader with a mass following, both prestigious and plebeian. 
capable of embodying the majesty of the state and the individuality of the common person endowed with unlimited power. In the absence of this type of charismatic leader, a totalitarian state may take the shape of military dictatorship, plebiscitary monarchy, or police state, but not of fascism. Fascism is specific in its way of enabling the people to identify with the all-powerful leader. The Fuhrer exercises by proxy the power and belongs to anyone. He stands for the ordinary person, strong and courageous enough to drive away all those profiteers, exploiters, parasites, bureaucrats, and politicians who are enmeshing the people with an anonymous system and depriving it of its will. Fascism implies the abolition of functional power at every level and its replacement by the personal power of the strongest and most able. It puts an end to the system. Henceforth, all power shall reflect the superior abilities of those in command. Only the best will stand at the head of society and the party. The quality of individuals will become the basis of hierarchy within society and the mass organizations of youth, women, workers, trade skills, etc., Promotion by means of connections and protections will be made impossible, and therefore occult networks of Freemasons, Jews, or bourgeois associations will be eradicated. The old, decadent, degenerate, and corrupt elite consisted of a mafia whose, mono whose mo monopoly consisted of, of a monopoly who monopolizes the best positions without, of course, being in any way the best, except at the sordid art of intrigue. A new plebeian elite will sweep away all this rot. It will ensure an identity between the hierarchy of functions and of ca capabilities. Fascism goes to great lengths, particularly through decorations, insignia, and uniforms, in the establishment of all sorts of hierarchies between people. Sports competitions, games, and tournaments play a, subst a substantial role in the selection of the most able. Physical prowess is a cardinal value since the physical superiority of the stronger over the weaker is, of all types of superiority, the least questionable, most easily measurable, and most obviously ontological. Holders of muscular strength and physical dexterity are powerful by themselves. The power they draw from their strength owes nothing to social position, connections, or cultural mediation. Fascism is a virile cultural revolution it aims at liquidating bourgeois values, property, saving, culture, family life, oh, family life, privacy, good manners, charity, tolerance, etc., and substituting the so-called vital values. It expects its leaders to excel in these, at least in appearance. Hence, its frequent borrowings from feudal society. Fascism aims to be a brutal and barbaric liberation, the unshackling of the power of those whose strength has hitherto been held in check by, a fur by the furtive maneuvers of profiteers. It places in place of the old state, whose machinery of domination was dominated by nobody, and where no one had power over the structure of power, the new state will be a pyramid of personal powers impelled by one and the same common will, that of our beloved leader. You want to read for a minute? This, at any rate... Hold on. Is the ideology of fascism. It rejects political parties and the party system, not simply as has often been said, because it is based on the will of and permanent unmediated communion between the Fuhrer and the people, but more fundamentally because fascism replaces an autonomous system of power with the power of a person. The specific aim of political parties is to seek to place their members in the control room of the state machinery. All parties are alike in this respect. They are all replicas of the state apparatus which they seek to control. They are all associations of people aspiring to some sort of functional power, prepared to share out key government posts among themselves by a combination of intrigue, negotiation, wheeling and dealing, betrayal and blackmail. Once there, following the laws of the system, they will only display their personal impotence. For fascism, the abolition of parties is inherent in the abolition of the aimless machinery of impersonal power, which is the state. This is a long way from the simplistic explanation of fascism as a device invented by monopoly capital to serve as a diversion from economic crisis. 
drawing its support from a reactionary middle class threatened with proletarianization. In fact, fascist ideology is an expression and mobilization of a set of needs, frustrations, and aspirations created by the system of domination specific to industrialized societies. The themes of fascist ideology can be found permanently, if in diffused form, among all levels and classes of society, especially among the popular classes, and in France in the speeches of the Communist Party leadership, but only in exceptional circumstances, such as an economic crisis blocking social mobility, and with a charismatic leadership, can these themes and the masses who spontaneously propagate them give rise to a radicalized political movement. The replacement of a system of functional domination by the continuous promotion of the most able, the replacement of a class monopolizing positions of power by the personal power of a Fuhrer, and the elimination of the state and its bureaucracy in favor of mass organizations mobilized by a single will and goal. All this amounts to a radical transformation of society and the state and a complete overhaul of every existing institution. In some respects, it is an agenda resembling that of the socialist movement. Yet, all of these transformations also imply transformations in the productive system. The elimination of the giant technical machineries, administrative and economic units. In short, every institutional agency whose size and complexity are not susceptible to control by personal power, and which therefore require a functional division of tasks, including those of management. <clears throat> Nothing of the sort has ever been envisaged by fascism. Instead, the Fuhrer principle, according to which everything at every level is subject to the personal will and power of the Fuhrer, requires increased centralization within the machinery of domination in order to ensure that no personal power can be exercised outside that of the Fuhrer. The machinery of power must therefore be cast in the mold of a military machine, with its ranks, hierarchical controls, rules of obedience, and strict discipline. The only power permitted outside that of the Fuhrer is the power delegated to revocable underlings acting in the Fuhrer's name. Thus, instead of the promotion of the most able, lower leadership tends to be selected on the basis of loyalty and, reli loyalty and reliability. Competitive conformism and servility toward the beloved leader and the leader's representatives tend to become the major qualities required of those seeking to make a career. Thus, the personal power of the Fuhrer functions as a sort of ideological cover for the total bureaucratization of public life. Consequently, fascist states tend to present the worst failings and perversions of the bureaucratic capitalist state in exaggerated form. Moreover, it is no longer possible to point them out. <laughs> Official propaganda insists upon their disappearance, and there are no means of opposing the official line. The Fuhrer and entourage are presented as the heroes of the historical epic in progress and the authors of every decision that has been taken. The implementation of decisions requires the militarization of both economic and administrative activities with all its ensuing waste, corruption, nepotism, black marketeering, and unaccountability. Hitler and Stalin's police states were remarkably similar in this respect. Thus, in modern societies, the abolition of functional power of functional in favor of personal power finally results in dictatorship by the holders of functional power and personification of the machinery of domination. Hold on, dude. The... Oh, I gotta change this shit up. Is it because I took it off screen share? Yeah. Okay. I was just like, yeah, I couldn't, I, I didn't know what you had on the screen for the recording. Cause I just, it's weird, everybody. I'm used to doing these recordings myself, but right now Nancy's doing them. And so it's like, we haven't found our system yet. So we're working with my computer being broken right here. This laptop's barely hanging on. It's like making noises and stuff. And it's like crapping out. So Nancy's doing the recordings today. I'm glad we did that backup earlier today. Yeah. Like, Nance recorded a backup copy because my copy, it turned out when I went back over it, it's not good. So it's pretty cool. It's pretty cool. We've lost entire things before, or at least I've lost entire things before. And so it's good to have yeah, dude. backups. We keep losing gores. <laughs> dude, the whole system is against us reading gores. 
All right. Yeah. Normally people who want to talk about capital, like they also just want some, some person to step in and, or some small group of uh, people to step in. And it's just like, yeah, it's kind of crazy. It's a system where the, the ranks can be filled with people who are loyal as opposed to skilled. It has nothing to do with skill at that point because uh, the, the, the kind of power based in merit through like through skill has been so dispersed that you can just fill the ranks with people who are j- just just there to make it function right they their 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 thoughts on what really is good or whatever that doesn't matter you know this is what this is why it's such a good connection with Arendt's um banal form of evil yeah you know Want me to read for a bit? Um, hold on. I think, or yeah, actually, well, yeah, we're almost done with this we chapter. Could, so we can start doing. Oh yeah, do you want? Well, because we can start doing three puff pass. Yeah, let's do that. This digression should help us to situate the problem of power more precisely. And if you want a screen share, I'll just read off yours so we don't keep having this problem. In modern societies, power does not have a subject. It only appears to be personal. In reality, it is the effect of a structure. It derives from the existence of a machinery of domination, which endows... Oh, let's see. Let's see. Let's see. In reality, it is the effect of a structure. It derives from the existence of a machinery of domination, which endows the functional powers those holding positions within it, whatever the nature of their abilities or political options. I misread that. It derives from the existence of a machinery of domination, which endows with functional powers, those holding positions within it, whatever the nature of their abilities or political options. As long as this machinery of domination remains intact, it is politically immaterial who the holders of positions of power may be. It is the structure of the machinery which will determine the nature of power and mode of government, the relation between the relationship between civil society and the political society, and between the political society and the state. The belief that the machinery of domination needs to be taken over in order to subsequently change it has been a long-standing illusion of reformists. This is not to say that reformism has not carried out reforms. It has, however, failed to change either the nature of power, the mode of government, or the relationship between civil society and the state. Its reforms have only served to reinforce and legitimate the machinery of power, the domination over the masses and their impotence. By its nature, the proletariat is incapable of becoming the subject of power. If its representatives take over the machinery of domination deployed by capital, they will succeed only in producing the very same type of domination and, in their turn, become a functional bourgeoisie. A class cannot overthrow another class merely by taking its place within the system of domination. All it will thereby achieve will be a permutation of office holders and by no means a transfer of power. The notion that the domination of capital can be transferred to the proletariat and thereby collectivized is a farcical, is as farcical as the ideal of making nuclear power stations democratic by transferring their management to the control of the trade union hierarchies. Dude, have you seen the skit from This Is America where Sasha Baron Cohen like talks to Bernie Sanders? I don't think I I fucking love Sasha Baron Cohen, but I don't think I watched that one. I, I did watch I This Is sh- America, but I don't remember that one. I would show it, except that I think that it would get struck. You know, this would get copyright struck hard. Um, but he's like, he's like a guy in a wheelchair. He's like some kind of like fat cowboy in a wheelchair. Like that's what he's dressed up as while he's interviewing Bernie. And Bernie's like, doesn't know what what what's going on. And he says, he says he's basically trying to tell Bernie that the solution is to take the 99% and put it into the 1%. And that way it will be 199%. And he's like trying to show him like the math. He's got like a whiteboard up and he's like actually trying to show the math. 
And he's like, you take, you just put it into the 1%. And then, you know, he, it's, it's really, I can't do it just, I cannot do it justice, but it really is like this paragraph. Um, it's like, uh, that's, that's, that's basically what he's saying. He's, you can't do it. You cannot put the 99% into the 1%. It doesn't work. Right. This is these 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 are functions, functional placeholders in a system of relations. Right. Do I have one more to read? The concept of seizure of power needs to needs to be fundamentally revised. Power can only be seized by an already existing dominant class. Taking power implies taking it away from its holders, not by occupying their posts but by making it permanently impossible for them to keep their machinery of domination running. Revolution is first and foremost the irreversible destruction of this machinery. It implies a form of collective practice capable of bypassing and superseding it through the development of an alternative network of relations. The day a new machinery of domination conferring functional powers on the rulers is generated by these practices, the revolution will have come to an end. A new institutional order will have been established. Previous revolutions have generally sought to eliminate all types of functional power so as to do away with all forms of domination. They have generally failed. Functional power has inevitably arisen anew from the machineries of social production and the division of labor underpinning them. We therefore cannot expect to eliminate relations of domination as a result of eliminating functional power. The only hope of abolishing relations of domination is to start by recognizing that functional power is inevitable. This recognition will enable us to look for ways of effectively restricting it to areas where it cannot be dispensed with. This will teach us to dissociate power from domination, keeping the first where necessary, doing away with the latter everywhere, and upholding the specific autonomies of civil society, the political society, and the state. This is the fucking argument to be had with anarchists over and over and over and over and over again. And what do you mean? Um, how there are many anarchists who think that like getting rid of these unjust hierarchies means doing away with the concept of verticality itself. And it's not just a thing among anarchists. Like there are a lot of like just left people. Um, right. Who think everything should be flattened out, but specifically with anarchists, me being a person who likes to travel in those circles, that's an argument that is constantly coming up over and over and over again. Um, what like they just they can't comprehend the fact that there is such a thing as skill. And there, like, there are such right. things as like people who need to be told what to do when they're in, involved in a productive endeavor by someone who has the knowledge and the skill and the this and the that. So functional power is inevitable. This recognition will enable us to look for ways of effectively restricting it to areas where it cannot be dispensed with. restricting it to areas where it cannot be dispensed with such as the realm of heteronymous labor right right or a captain on a ship right just like you have there there are places where it is absolutely indispensable we'll never right. be rid of it this will teach us to disassociate power from domination keeping the first where necessary doing away with the latter everywhere and upholding the specific autonomies of civil society, the political state, the political society, and the state. Chapter 6, A New Historical Subject, The Non-Class of Post-Industrial Proletarians. The crisis of socialism, socialism is, above all, a reflection of the crisis of the proletariat. The disappearance of the polyvalent skilled worker, the possible subject of productive labor, and hence of a revolutionary transformation of social relations has also entailed the disappearance of the class able to take charge of the socialist project and translate it into reality. Fundamentally, 
The degeneration of socialist theory and practice has its origins here. In Marx, scientific socialism rested on a dual foundation. Firstly, it was a project carried by a class of proletarianized social producers, producers that formed a virtual, virtual majority of the population. Secondly, this class was defined, in essence, by conscious rejection of its class being. Each proletarian, as a member of the class, was a living contradiction between his or her sovereign productive praxis and the commodity status which capitalist social relations conferred upon it by reducing it to an undifferentiated quantum of exploited labor. The proletariat was the potential subject of socialist revolution because each proletarian experienced a contradiction between sovereignty over her or his work and work relationships and the neg negation of this sovereignty by capital. Class unity and class consciousness were based upon the inevitability that each proletarian would, in his or her own activity, encounter the general negation of the sovereignty of all proletariat in, I think, probably of all proletarians. Class being was the intolerable and ubiquitous external limit to the activity of each and every class member. The proletariat was the only class in the first in history which had no interest but to cancel its class being by destroying the external constraints by which it had been constituted. For Marx, then, the proletariat was itself the negation of its own being. The task of scientific socialism was merely to demonstrate how this negation could become operationally effective and pass into positivity. As we have seen, however, the capitalist division of labor has destroyed the dual premise of scientific socialism. In the first place, the worker's labor no longer involves any power. A class whose social activity yields no power does not have the means to take power, nor does it feel called upon to do so. In the second place, work is no longer the worker's own activity. In the immense majority of cases, whether in the factory or the office, work is now a passive, pre-programmed activity which has been totally subordinated to the working of a big machinery, leaving no room for personal initiative. It is no longer possible for workers to identify with their work or their function in the productive process. Everything now appears to take place outside themselves. Work itself has become a quantum of reified activity awaiting and subjugating the worker. Loss of the ability to identify with one's work is tantamount to the disappearance of any sense of belonging to a class. Just as work remains external to the individual, so too does class belonging. Just as work has become a nondescript task carried out without any personal involvement, which, which one may quit for another equally contingent job, so too has class membership come to be lived as a contingent and meaningless fact. For workers, it is no longer a question of freeing themselves within work, putting themselves in control of work, or seizing power within the framework of their work. The point now is to free oneself from work by rejecting its nature, content, necessity, and modalities. But to reject work is also to reject the traditional strategy and organizational forms of the working class movement. It is no longer a question of winning power as a worker, but of winning the power no longer to function as a worker. The power at issue is not at all the same as before. The class itself has entered into crisis. That might be like the best paragraph. We might want to actually read that in the conversation with Tut. I mean, I was fantasizing while you were reading and I was outside smoking and I was thinking, man, I wish that we could just start up and just read this. We just read a few paragraphs, let them talk, read a few paragraphs, let them talk, read a few paragraphs, let them, we go through the whole book. <laughs> Dude, if he had the time for that, that'd be the shit. Yeah, I know. This crisis, however, is much more a crisis of a myth and an ideology than of a really existing working class. For over a century, the idea of the proletariat has succeeded in masking its own unreality. This idea is now as obsolete as the proletariat itself, since in place of the productive collective worker of, of old, a non-class of non-workers is coming into being, prefiguring a non-society within existing society in which classes will be abolished along with work itself and all forms of domination.
Oh, you're muted. <laughs> what were you saying? I was reading. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. In contradistinction to the working class, this non-class has not been engendered by capitalism and marked with the insignia of capitalist relations of production. It is the result of the crisis of capitalism and the dissolution of the social relations of capitalist production, a process stemming from the growth of new production technology. The negativity which, according to Marx, was to be embodied in the working class has by no means disappeared. It has been displaced and has acquired a more radical form in a new social area. As it has shifted, it has acquired a new form and content which directly negate the ideology, the material base, the social relations, and the juridical organization or state form of capitalism. It has the added advantage over Marx's working class of being immediately conscious of itself. Its existence is at once indissolubly subjective and objective, collective and individual. This non-class encompasses all those who have been expelled from production by the abolition of work or whose capacities are underemployed as a result of the industrialization, in this case, the automation and computerization of intellectual work. Dude, th <coughs> this goes perfect with non-belonging. Yeah. With, uh, with Todd's idea of like non-belonging. It's amazing. Yeah. I want to ask him if he's read this. It results. It results from, from the decomposition of the old society based upon the dignity, value, social utility, and desirability of work. It stretches into virtually every layer of society, well beyond those lumpen whom the Black Panthers, with remarkable prescience, counterposed in the late 1960s to the class of unionized, stably employed workers, protected by labor legislation and collective agreements. That traditional working class is now no more than a privileged minority. The majority of the population now belong to the post-industrial neo-proletariat, which, with no job security or definite class identity, fills the area of probationary, contracted, casual, temporary, and part-time employment. In the not-too-distant future, jobs such as these will be largely eliminated by automation. Even now, their specifications are continually changing with the rapid development of technology, and their requirements bear little relation to the knowledge and skills offered by schools and universities. The neo-proletariat is generally overqualified for the jobs it finds. It is generally condemned to underuse, underuse of its capacities when it is in work and to unemployment itself in the longer term. Any employment seems to be accidental and provisional. Every type of work purely contingent. It cannot feel any involvement with its work or identification with its job. Work no longer signifies an activity or even a major occupation. It is merely a blank interval on the margins of life to be endured in order to earn a little money. In contrast to the proletariat in Marx's theory, the neo-proletariat does not define itself by reference to its work and cannot be defined in terms of its position within the social process of production. The question of who does or does not belong to the class of productive workers, how to categorize a keenest therapist, a tourist guide, an airline employee, a systems analyst, a technician in a biological laboratory, or a telecommunications engineer – has no meaning or importance when set against a growing and more or less numerically dominant mass of people moving from one job to another, learning trades they will never regularly practice, following courses without outlets or practical utility, giving them up or failing them because, after all, what does it matter? They go on to work in the post office during the summer, to pick grapes in the autumn, to join a department store staff for Christmas, and to work as a laborer in the spring. I've literally done two of those four jobs. And like one of them was seasonal Christmas work at Walmart. Um, 
another was yeah being a like doing construction during the during when it was in season right i've also done construction outside of season which is the worst thing ever the yeah, only certainty sucks, is far- dude Fuck yeah. Sucks ass. <laughs> yeah it's the worst uh like foundations in the winter mud slush soaking wet freezing everyone miserable you have to be strong as fuck too and you have to be running basically the whole time it's, it's crazy the only the only certainty as far as they are concerned is that they do not feel they belong to the working class or to any other class i think that you can be in the in that situation and then find out about the working class and find people who are speaking to it and that can change the situation and you can actually feel like you're a part of it like bernie you know could make you go shit dude it's true i've never had shit this is bullshit um or you could hear someone like uh oliver anthony singing and you go damn that's real like i think you could kind of like get like so some kind of class consciousness but the point is is like can that be your your central identity can it's like work is your is the central thing sucking away all your time energy but working class is not the central thing in your identity except for a handful of people who are super into usually history or philosophy right or a handful of people who feel quite represented in the, the union, you know, and you still meet them or, or like, I'm trying to think like at Amazon crew of 30 people, there was one person who seemed to kind of get it, but even then it was, it only really manifested in antagonizing the bosses in a somewhat playful way, but it wasn't like, there wasn't like, a, I, I floated, I walked around, I asked people questions and stuff. And I got the sense that there was probably overall like, five people who'd be interested in a union, you know, a lot of people were super opposed to it. Um, I had a lot of great conversations with the people who were interested in it. Um, and they definitely saw themselves as workers. Um, and they, they definitely understood the situation, but the thing is, is yeah, it's, it's, it's like how much time energy can you really put into that when all of it's already sucked away by a job? And then you won't even be at this job in the near future. Like this is temp work. Like most people are not at Amazon for the long haul. You know, so there's a super high turnover rate, which is actually really good for them because it gets it allows them to refine, making you increasingly fungible, replaceable. Whether they work in a bank, the civil service, a cleaning agency, or a factory, neo-proletarians are basically non-workers temporarily doing something that means nothing to them. They do any old thing which anyone could do, provisionally engaged in temporary and nameless work. For them, Work is no longer an individual contribution to the total production of society made up of countless individual activities. Social production is now given first, and work is merely the mass of insecure short-term activities to which it gives rise. Workers no longer produce society through the mediation of the relations of production. Instead, got to scroll. Where, where are we at? Now I'm all lost. For them, work is no longer an individual contribution to the total production of society made up of countless individual activities. Social production is now given first, and work is merely the mass of insecure short-term activities to which it gives rise. Workers no longer produce society through the mediation and the relations of production. Instead, the machinery of social production as a whole produces work and imposes it in a random way upon random interchangeable individuals. Work, in other words, does not belong to the individuals who perform it, nor can it be termed their own activity. It belongs to the machinery of social production, is allocated and programmed by it, remaining external to the individuals upon whom it is imposed. Instead of being the worker's mode of insertion into a system of universal cooperation, Work is now the mode of subordination to the machinery of universal domination. Oh, it's really good. Instead of generating workers able to to transcend their finite particularity and define themselves directly as social producers in general, work has come to be perceived by individuals as the contingent form of social oppression in general. The proletariat, which the young Marx saw as a universal force, void of any particularized form, has become a particularized individuality in revolt against the universal force of the apparatus. 
the inversion of the Marxist concept of the proletariat is thus total. Not only does the new post-industrial proletariat not find any source of potential power in socialized labor, all it finds there is the reality of apparatus power and its own impotence. Not only is it no longer the possible subjective agent of socialized productive labor, instead, it defines its own subjectivity through the refusal of socialized labor and the negation of work perceived itself as a negation or alienation. Nothing indicates that this total alienation of socialized work can be reversed. Technological development does not point, point towards a possible appropriation of social production by the producers. Instead, it indicates further elimination of the social producer and continuing marginalization of socially necessary labor as a result of the computer revolution. Whatever the number of jobs remaining in industry and the service sector once automation has been fully achieved, they will be incapable of providing identity, meaning, and power for those who fill them. For there is a rapid decline in the amount of labor time necessary to reproduce, not this society and its mechanisms of, of domination and command, but a viable society endowed with everything useful and necessary to life. The requirement could be a mere two hours a day, or 10 hours a week, or 15 weeks a year, or 10 years in a lifetime. The substantially longer period of social labor maintained in contemporary society has accelerated rather than slowed down the devaluation, in the ethical sense, of all forms of work. The amount of time spent working and the relatively high level of employment have been artificially maintained because of the inextricable confusion which exists between the production of the necessary and the superfluous, the useful and the useless, waste and wealth, pleasures and nuisances, destruction and repair. Whole areas of economic life now have the sole function of providing work or of producing for the sake of keeping people working. Motherfuckers in Oregon who pump your gas, for instance. But when a society, dude, dude but when a society produces in order to provide work rather than works in order to produce, then work as a whole has no meaning. Its chief objective is simply to keep people occupied and thereby to preserve the relations of subordination, competition, and discipline upon which the workings of the dominant system are based. Work in general comes to be tainted with the suspicion that it is but a useless compulsion devised to mask the fact of each individual's redundancy, or, to put it another way, to conceal the possibility of liberation from socialized labor itself and the obsolescence of a system of social relations which makes socialized labor the precondition of both income and the circulation of wealth. The specificity of the post-industrial proletariat follows from this analysis. In contradistinction to the traditional working class, this non-class is free subjectivity. While the industrial proletariat derived an objective power from the transformation of matter so that it perceived itself as a material force underpinning the whole course of society, the neo-proletariat can be defined as a non-force without objective social importance excluded from society. Since it plays no part in the production of society, it envisages society's development as something external, akin to a spectacle or a show. It sees no point in taking over the machine-like structure which, as it sees it, defines contemporary society, nor of placing anything whatsoever under its control. What matters instead is to appropriate areas of autonomy outside of, and in, in opposition to, the logic of society, so as to allow the unobstructed realization of individual development alongside and over that machine-like structure. The lack of an overall conception of future society fundamentally distinguishes the new post-industrial proletariat from the class which, according to Marx, was invested with a historical mission. The neo-proletariat has nothing to expect of contemporary society, nor of its subsequent evolution. That process, the development of the productive forces, has reached its end by making work virtually superfluous. It can go no further. The logic of capital, which after two centuries of progress has led to this outcome through the accumulation of ever more efficient means of production, can offer no more and no better. More precisely, productivist industrial society can only continue by offering more and worse, more destruction, more waste, more repairs to destruction, more programming of the most intimate facets of individual life. 
That's the control society aspect. That's the psychopolitics aspect. That's why people who do hold the reproductive function of the PMC, uh, virtue hoarding and acting like uh, changing your language fixes the system is an insult. It's an insult. Progress has arrived at a threshold beyond which plus turns into minus. The future is heavy with menace and devoid of promise. The forward march of productivism now brings the advance of barbarism and oppression. There is therefore no point in wondering where we are going or in seeking to identify with laws imminent in historical development. We are not going anywhere. History has no meaning. There is nothing to be hoped from history and no reason to sacrifice anything to that idol. No longer can we give ourselves to a transcendent cause, expecting that it will repay our suffering and reward our sacrifice with interest. We must, however, be clear about what we do desire. The logic of capital has brought us to the threshold of liberation, but it can only be crossed at the price of a radical break in which productivism is replaced by a different rationality. This rupture can only come from individuals themselves. The realm of freedom can never arise out of material processes. It can only be established by a, const a constitutive act, which, aware of its free subjectivity, asserts itself as an absolute end in itself within each individual. Only the non-class of non-producers is capable of such an act, for it alone embodies what lies beyond productivism the rejection of the accumulation ethic and the dissolution of all classes fucking goes hard dude that's fucking metal dude god damn that's crazy to me like like when i think of the sds and how they like suddenly i'm like wow okay if anybody involved with the sds in the 60s was aware of that idea then that makes me a lot more sympathetic of a lot of the things that they were doing. So it's like, I, it makes me wonder, like, I, I think he's sublating the new left. I don't think he's, he's not like, he's not like Marcuse was supposedly like one of their gurus or whatever. He's, he's trying to sublate like this basic thing that they did see, right? Like they saw it and God damn. Yeah. He's, I mean, I, I fuck. Yeah, where have they been hiding this guy? Yeah, yeah, it's Who, fucked who's up. Who's hiding dude. him? Like who's hiding him? All the, like all the conversations we've had, not all of them, but there's so much that's that is that is here, and it's just like, okay, so if this is the the if this is the shit that we're kind of talking about, like that feels new right now but gores was writing about this in the you know late 60s 70s and 80s like like wh why why are there still why are <laughs> mainstream left figures still ignoring it or acting like we're coming up with I don't it, like it. It's it's just it's fucking weird to me. It is weird. It's like why, what, like like we're getting gaslit. Yeah, yeah. dude. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. It is I, I wonder if that clicks? Like I, I said at the beginning of this reading this morning that some people, this shit will not click for them the way it's gonna. It it hits different once you come through a bunch of other avenues, and so it's like. I want to know how it's hitting you all. I really do. I want to know. I want to know if like some people are just going to, I suspect a couple people at least are going to get in here and be like, no, nah, man, this is bullshit. No, for sure. And I just and hope that I hope that they take the time to take it seriously and consider the fact that uh, we're not reading it at face value. It's that we've been having all these other conversations from not just our own observations, but also a whole lot of other um authors that are not a part of any of the currently existing influencer sphere people figureheads canon it's not a part of any of their canon 
the institutions that exist today and all of the alternative media and all of the teaching platforms and all of the figures involved in all of it, none of them have the canon that Theory Underground has up its sleeve. Like uh, most of, like even just what's already on, on catalog, but this shit's, well, and like this shit only really lands for me the way it does because of the catalog and how he's bringing together so many different threads. Like he is CMT pilled, he is PMC pilled, but he goes beyond both of those in a really interesting way. Um, he's it's like Burnham and 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 Aaron Riker is scratching like a little side of it, um, and. And he also gets time energy at the gut level. Like he doesn't need to theorize the energy part. He doesn't need to do this existential phenomenology of it that I'm doing. He doesn't need to, practically speaking. Um, I think it helps. I think that this helps time energy theory and that time energy theory helps this. But but on its own, how – where's the people for this? Yeah. Right? Like I don't think it's there. And so it's just like it's crazy to me. It is fucking crazy. And I would have, like, rode hard for Gores. Like, Gores was the fucking thinker I've been waiting for my whole life. Like, for real, though, but... Yeah. Um, no, it, it it is. He's... he's. I mean, fuck, dude. There's, there's, like, Ayn Rand in this, too. Like, it's not just... Uh, like, new left bullshit. Like, he really is dealing with people who actually exist like earlier when he's talking about like uh i can't remember the exact words right now i'm tired Haynes. but Sh uh, schumpeter yeah yeah like there's there's this stuff in here that um like he's he's looking up from books and and looking at real people and seeing things and incorporating them into to his fucking method um and i love that because so many so many people don't do that. They're just like, oh, yeah, you know, history and blah, 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 blah. No, it's fucking dope, dude. Chapter well, seven. One the post-industrial revolution. Both the strength and the weakness of the post-industrial proletariat lie in the fact that it does not have an overall vision of future society. There are no messianic or comprehensive theories to provide it either with cohesion or with continuity of action. The neo-proletariat is no more than a vague area made up of constantly changing individuals whose main aim is not to seize power in order to build a new world, but to regain power over their own lives by disengaging from the market rationality of productivism. It cannot be otherwise. Society cannot be reconstructed by decree, and a comprehensive vision has no meaning or purchase unless it is an extension of an already developing process. But the crisis of the industrial system heralds no new world. Nothing in it is indicative of a redeeming transformation. The present does not receive any meaning from the future. The silence of history therefore returns individuals to themselves. Forced back upon their own subjectivity, they have to take the floor on their own behalf. No future society speaks through their mouth. Since the society disintegrating before our eyes heralds no new order. The non-class engendered by the decomposition of present-day society can only conceive of the non-society of which it is the prefiguration. The term non-class should not, of course, be taken to imply the absence of social relations and social organization. It is used to designate the process of subtraction from the social sphere of an area of individual sovereignty beyond economic rationality and external constraint. The primacy attached to individual sovereignty echoes that revolutionary bourgeois thought which the bourgeoisie itself rejected once it had obtained power. It flies in the face of orthodox socialist thinking, whose implicit premise has always been that individuals should find personal fulfillment in the appropriation of collective reality and in the common production of the social whole. In Marx, there appeared to be some basis for this premise, in that he expected full development of the productive forces to engender fully developed individuals capable of appropriating the productive forces as a whole. It was assumed that there would be a continuum and an absence of conflict between individual activity and social production, and vice versa. 
the personalization of social activity and the socialization of personal activity. What the fuck? Okay. And the, pers and the socialization of personal activity were taken to be the two sides of communist development. Marx's postulate has never been practically verified. The productive forces, or to be more precise, production techniques, did not develop in such a way that socialized production, or socially necessary labor, could become an enriching personal activity, nor above all, in such a way that the organization and division of labor at the level of society as a whole could be controlled, reflected upon, and experienced by each individual as the universally desired result of a voluntary cooperation. Everything now indicates that it is impossible to create a highly industrialized society, and hence a world order, which presents itself to each individual as the desired outcome of his or her free social cooperation with other individuals. There is a difference in both scale and nature between communal work or life and the social totality. Although it may be possible to build, build a highly conscious community through total personal involvement in cooperative activity, conflicts, and effective relations, so that everyone assures the cohesion of what they feel to be their community, society as a whole will still remain a system of relations embodied in and governed by institutional organizations, infrastructures of communication and production, and a geographical and social division of labor whose inertia is its guarantee of continuity and efficacy. As a structured system, society is necessarily external to its members. It is not the product of free, voluntary cooperation. Individuals do not produce it by starting from themselves. They produce it on the ground of its own inert exigencies, adapting themselves to the jobs, functions, skills, environments, and hierarchical relations pre-established by society to assure its cohesive functioning. This pre-establishment of socially necessary activities is not the work of a subjective agent, a genius leader, or supreme guide, at least not in market societies. Planning committees, civil service departments, private and public technocracies, and governments themselves certainly carry out the work of programming, regulating, forecasting, and adjusting. Yet this manifold of collective, anonymous, conflictual, and fragmented activities never crystallizes into a comprehensive project under the personal direction of the head of the executive or the ruling political party. In other words, the cohesive workings of society appear to be assured, for good or ill, by, qua by a quasi-subject, the state. But the state is not a real subject, it is no one. In itself, it is no more than an administrative machine controlled by no one and incapable of formulating a general will which everyone may be called upon to express. The limits, dysfunctions, and weaknesses of the capitalist state mean that society is always imperfectly cohesive and, as a result, that more or less substantial areas of indeterminacy and freedom will remain. Since it advocates social integration not through the random play of multiple initiatives and conflicts, but through consciously willed or plan consciously willed planning or programming of the activity of society. Socialist political theory implicitly gives society precedence over the individual and assumes their common subordination to the state. This latter is called upon to coordinate the global project of development, whose imperatives are to be internalized by each and all as a common will and a social cement. In theory, the superiority of socialist society lies in the fact that the outcome of multiple activities is not, as in market societies, a random result which can only be corrected after the event, either by the state or by individuals themselves, with all the waste, delay, duplication, and error that this entails. The specificity of socialism lies in the fact that the results of social activity are determined in advance as an objective chosen by the collectivity, so that each person's activity is adapted, regulated, and programmed as a function of this collective goal. The problem, however, is precisely to define the collective goal. I shall return to this point in the next chapter. For the moment, let me simply note that whatever the process by which one or several collective projects are elaborated, and whatever the choice or choices of the type of society and culture they imply, it will always be a process that requires mediation and mediators. It cannot be undertaken by individuals as such, nor even by 
the associated producers, local communities or councils, Soviets. It implies an overall vision of what society is to become, and even pluralism, a multiplication of decision-making centers, an increase in the space allowed to individual liberty, and careful, and careful limitation of the area encompassed by the state's sphere amount to an overall vision. But even if such a vision is the result of genuinely democratic political debate involving parties and movements, its application will still entail planning, and planning requires a state. Of course, the elaboration of the plan may itself be hedged about with democratic safeguards. There may, for example, be broad consultation to establish the possibilities and preferences of each collective of producers, each local community, each region, etc., and several ups and downs to the coordinating body, back to the grassroots community and vice versa to allow each to correct the other as the plan is carried out. Yet however open and sincerely democratic the process of consultation, the plan, the plan schedule and objectives will never be the expression of a common civic will or of grassroots preferences. The mediations which made it possible to coordinate broad social options with grassroots preferences will be so complex and so numerous that the local community will be unable to recognize itself in the final result. The result, the plan, will inevitably be the work of a state technocracy obliged to make use of the mathematical models and statistical materials, which in itself can only imperfectly control because of the very large number of inputs, variables, and unforeseeable elements. Thus, the plan will never be a photograph of everyone's preferences, but will have to adjust each subset of preferences in the light of all the other subsets and of the technico-economic constraints upon their coherence. In the last analysis, democratic elaboration of the plan does not allow each and all to become the subject of that revolutionary social cooperation through which the associated producers are supposed to impose their common will upon the society they seek to create. Instead, the plan remains an auto autonomized result intended by no one and experienced by all as a set of external constraints. From the point of view of the individual, the plan has no advantage over the market. It too expresses an average of heterogeneous preferences, which like the average consumer or the person in the street of market surveys does not correspond to the real preferences of real people. I wish sociologists tended to know that. The person in the street never exists as self, only as the others. In these circumstances, it is wrong to make it everyone's patriotic, civic, or political duty to equate the objectives of the plan with his or her personal fulfillment, for that is to require an unconditional identity between individual and state, an abandonment of the specificity and autonomy of all values and activities not related to politics and the economy. From being soldiers of production in the capitalist economy, individuals end up as soldiers permanently mobilized to serve a plan presented to them as the emanation of the general will. As long as the protagonists of socialism continue to make centralized planning, however much it might be broken down into local and regional plans, the linchpin of their, of their program, and the adherence of everyone to the democratically formulated objectives of the plan, the core of their political doctrine, socialism will remain an unattractive proposition in industrial societies. The source of the theoretical superiority of socialism over capitalism is thus the source of its practical inferiority. To argue that society should be the controlled, programmed result of its members' activity is to demand that everyone should make their conduct functional to the overall social result in view. Thus, there can be no room for any form of conduct which, if generalized, would not lead to the programmed social outcome. Classical socialist doctrine finds it difficult to come to terms with political and social pluralism, understood not simply as a plurality of parties and trade unions, but as the coexistence of various ways of working, producing, and living, various and distinct cultural areas and levels of social existence. See, so he's sublating the only thing that Dugan has going for him. So, it's like, like it, it, do, I, I think David is really, really, I mean, I think he's probably genuine. genuine. I think he, he genuinely he wants to live in a pluralist society. It's, it's just a pluralist society, society, society of highly exploitative nation-state states. You're right, right. 
Yeah, I don't know. I don't know about Dugan. Um, I think he's a crackpot. But maybe he's genuine. But he's definitely responding to real shit. And he's definitely like that's that's and he's he's right about plurality. Like that's well, it's, it's the thing. He, he just he, he he takes a bunch of things that matter, yeah. them up into something, and puts puts a nice, nice new spin, spin on it to make it sound like it's not racist. Like it's it's, it's uh, uh you know, you know he's, he's 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 just repackaging a bunch of different threads. But, but I think it's you know, you know done to the explicit purposes of the of, of more or less you keep it. It's like, it's like oh, oh we, don't we don't like what the United States is doing. We want Russia, Russia China. China and like, and like seven, seven other big big centers of power, power six other big centers of power to do, to do what the US is doing instead. instead. Right? Like, right? Like that's that's the thing about that, that approach, approach is that it's still, still like it's, it's still it's still a realist yep. most, most people spend their lives, lives working kind of model. model. Well yeah, and it's yeah. I mean it's just more girl bosses, more black capitalism. Right like it really is the same fucking argument. Yeah, yeah, he just says you keep your black capitalism and your girl bosses and your LGBT plus IA over there. there. Hmm? And we'll have our, our, our you know, Russian Orthodox thing over here and we can do what we want to our neighbors and you get to do what you want to your neighbors. Yeah. Okay. okay. Which is why it's hypocritical in a sort of sense to go after them. But, you know. Yeah. Because it's like, <laughs> yeah. well, we do do it to our neighbors already, <laughs> yeah. you know. But, but all right. Yet this kind of pluralism precisely conforms to the lived experience and aspirations of the post-industrial proletariat, as well as the major part of the traditional working class. Only by continually stressing and defending its importance can market societies maintain their legitimacy in the eyes of the majority of the population. And it is precisely because the socialist movement has failed to embrace and enrich this pluralist perspective that it has condemned itself to a minority position even among working people. Essentially, the freedom which the majority of the population of the overdeveloped nations seeks to protect from collectivism and the totalitarian threat is the freedom to create a private niche protecting one's personal life against all pressures and external social obligations. This niche may be represented by family life, a home of one's own, a back garden, a do-it-yourself workshop, a boat, a country cottage, a collection of antiques, music, gastronomy, sport, love, etc. Its importance varies inversely with the degree of job satisfaction and in direct proportion with the intensity of social pressures. It represents a sphere of sovereignty rested, or to be rested, from a world governed by the principles of productivity, aggression, competition, hierarchical discipline, etc., Capitalism owes its political stability to the fact that, in return for the dispossession and growing constraints experienced at work, individuals enjoy the possibility of building an apparently growing sphere of individual autonomy outside of work. It is possible, following Rudolf Barrow, to regard this individual sphere as a sort of compensation for the repression and frustration of the emancipatory needs and to conclude that such compensatory needs will disappear after the general abolition of the condition of subordination associated with the vertical division of labor. This, however, is a dangerously simplistic view. The sphere of individual sovereignty is not based upon a mere desire to consume nor solely upon relaxation and leisure activities. It is based, more profoundly, upon activities unrelated to any economic goal which are an end in themselves. Communication, giving, creating, and aesthetic enjoyment, the production and reproduction of life, tenderness, the realization of physical, sensuous, and intellectual capacities, the creation of non-commodity use values, shared goods or services, that could not be produced as commodities because of their unprofitability. In short, the whole range of activities that make up the fabric of existence and therefore occupy a primordial rather than a subordinate place. An inversion of the scale of priorities involving a subordination of socialized work governed by the economy to activities constituting the sphere 
of individual autonomy is underway in every class within the overdeveloped societies and particularly among the post-industrial neo-proletariat. Real life begins outside of work, and work itself has become a means toward the extension of the sphere of non-work, a temporary occupation by which individuals acquire the possibility of pursuing their main activities. This is a cultural mutation announcing the transition to a post-industrial society. It implies a radical subversion of the ideology, scale of values, and social relations established by capitalism, but it will only eliminate capitalism if its latent content is revealed in the form of an alternative to capitalism that is able to capture the developing cultural mutation and give it political extension. The idea that economically oriented social labor should serve to extend the sphere of individual autonomy, meaning free time activity, was already central in Marxist thought. Its realization was synonymous with the advent of communism and the extinction of political economy. Pan-economism, or the subordination of every activity to those associated with the economy, is specific to capitalist development. Only with capitalism does work, or the heteronymous production of exchange values, become a full-time activity and the self-supply of goods and services by the family or community become a marginal and subordinate activity. An inversion of this relationship will signify the end of political economy and the advent of post-industrial socialism or communism. It is an inversion already underway, although this has been more or less successfully concealed by the dominant system. In fact, the hegemony of economic rationality has never been total. As feminist theorists have indicated, the sphere of commodity production could never have existed without a parallel sphere of household production not subject to economic rationality. In particular, all activities associated with the reproduction of life are outside the domain of economic rationality, as are the majority of aesthetic and pedagogic activities, raising children, looking after and decorating a house, repairing or making things, cooking good meals, entertaining guests, listening to or performing music. None of these activities is carried out for economic ends or for consumption. This extra economic sphere, by no means necessarily confined to the home or the nuclear family, has in practice always been as important as the sphere of economic production, providing it with a concealed material base through the unremunerated and unmeasured housework of women and, to a lesser extent, of children and grandparents. Such work has never been recognized in capitalist society because it does not create a surplus that can be accumulated or sold on the market. It has never been redefined, or sorry, it has never been defined as work, but seen as a sort of personal service without economic value. For some theorists of the women's movement, housework is therefore an, an enclave of slave labor within the capitalist economy. The bourgeoisie, that's kind of how Nancy Fraser and Rahal Yegi talk about it in their book on capitalism. Um, the bourgeoisie may have abolished slavery relations between workers and bosses, but it has not done so in the relations between men and women. According to this interpretation, it only it is only right to extend market regulations to the sphere of housework, integrating it into the sector of activity governed by economic ends. Housework should be waged to the extent that it cannot be industrialized. The only value of this uselessly simplistic and regressive theory <laughs> lies in its demonstration carried to absurd lengths that the autonomous activities of the extra not sorry. <laughs> I wish that I I wish that you hadn't been muted at that moment because that was such a good laugh. I saw you cracking up over there. And anybody who's just listening, you just gotta know like he rolled. <laughs> he rolled back. Dude. <laughs> the only value of this uselessly simplistic <laughs> and regressive theory. Dude, it's like his jouissance gets this little moment out of like this whole book. It gets its real like it surfaces in something a little bit more like it's like most of the time it's like look with with Lenin, even with Marx, it's like it comes out all the time. Um, Gores keeps it way under the surface and then right here it's just like the only <laughs> value of this uselessly simplistic and regressive theory i mean seriously do the dumb fucking liberal bullshit trying to sell oh trying to sell work as noble and therefore we need to be paid for all aspects of life that are productive it's like um you're trying to make 
the one remaining enclave of humanity into a market relation. You know, you're impo you're imposing that into the relationship. Like, no wonder people are fucking miserable, man. Yeah. According to this interpretation, it is only right to extend market. Oh, wait. Oh, yeah. The only value of this uselessly simplistic and regressive theory lies in its demonstration carried to absurd lengths that the autonomous activities of the extra economic sphere fall outside any possible economic rationalization. Political economy here reaches its limit. Indeed, if housework re remu were remu re remunerated at the marginal price of an hour's work so that the performance of an hour's housework entitled the person in question to receive the quantity of goods and services that could be produced in one hour in the commodity sector, the cost of domestic payments would be so high as to exceed the capacities of even the most opulent society. But that's why, to people who belong to the upper middle and ruling classes, they think, yeah, no, this is great. This is a great, this is a great idea. Because, of course, what they really mean is that care jobs will be uh, occupied by migrant workers, right? Undocumented Mexican women, you know, women from Guatemala. Like that's that's the like who do you think does Hillary Clinton's laundry? This example is even more suggestive for its non-economic implications than for its economic significance. Who do you think washes Trump's toilet? I just want to throw that in there as well. Like the point is, is that it's like whether you're for girl bosses or guy bosses, fucking asshole bosses or woke bosses, it doesn't fucking matter. Like who's washing their toilets? That's what they take for granted. So for them, their theory of feminism or patriarchy or what have you, it doesn't touch our lives. Like it, it, it has nothing to do with our lives. You know, and so people take on these value frameworks into their own lives. And I would call that false consciousness. I, like, I don't know about this new definition of false consciousness I keep hearing, <laughs> but I'm just saying like, yeah, when you take on, when you actually go around thinking that you're a girl boss, when you're working at Walmart or a fucking Starbucks, it's like, you don't realize that this is the ideology of someone who pays undocumented people, or if they're super rich, you know, they even pay a decent amount for people to do their laundry, to clean their toilets, to wash their dishes. They don't do that. You know, and it's like people take on this like, oh, I should be paid for housework. No, bitch. We fucking all share in the labor. We all share in it. We all do. Which is why I wash dishes and I do. I carry my fucking load. But the point is, is like people who are just like, oh, like I, I, uh, I went on a date with someone one time. We went back to her house and the counters were covered in like this grime and it had like chunks of like, it was like the grossest thing I've ever seen in my life. And she's studying law and she's like, well, once I'm a lawyer, I'm not going to, I'll pay someone to do this. So I'm not worrying about it right now. She literally said that. And it was the grossest house I've ever been in. I was like, this person, you wouldn't tell, you couldn't tell like. But this person does not clean up after themselves. Hello. Oh, I know who you're talking about. Oh, here, let me. Anne has heard of this and knows who I'm talking about. And <laughs> we're, we're not going to say any names or anything. But all right, let's go ahead and put this on the speaker. Can't, does it work? No. The stupid fucking speaker fell asleep. <laughs> I want Anne to be. This is so weird, your laptop. That? <laughs> so and and can hear the noise of the laptop and none of you all can so, it sounds like this <laughs> like a like a mo tiny motorcycle or a lawnmower is so inside of people that live inside of like horton here's a who world they're just all trying to start their Lawnmower at the same time. They're trying to tell you we are here. We are here. Yeah, we are here. We are here. We are here. What do they want from me? I will give it to them if they will stop. Motos. Freedom. <laughs> Wait, sorry. What did you say there? Motos. Motos. Mo <laughs> they want. Yeah. They are motos. Um, and I'm gonna moto this morning. I'm gonna go because I got some water boiling. I just came to see if you need some food. Yes. Cool. Broccoli or something. What is that? I don't need a lot of food because I've been eating on nuts. Like okay, cool. I'll, I'll, on these bad boys. Thank you. 
might make a couple of chicken bits too in the air fryer after you're done. Okay. We're making good time, right? Yeah. Hell yeah. Okay. So let's keep going. Um, yeah. So share housework, people. This idea that someone else is going to do it for you. It's crazy. And I think there are a lot of anti-work people who are just like, oh, yeah. They get all their food takeout. They have other people clean up after them. They're lazy as fuck. And they're just like, oh, yeah, I'm anti-work. I'm for fully automated gay space luxury, luxury communism. Woohoo. And it's like, they're just lazy people, right? And it's like, that there will never be enough robots to do everything for everybody. You will always have to clean your own ass to wipe your own ass. You will also have to like shower your own body and you will, uh, you have to clean your own toilet. And if you don't, someone else has to. And if you think, oh, a robot can do it. Well, how many people have to work to make that robot exist? How many people are caught up in heteronymous labor on the side of the robots, like keeping them going? The point is, it's like, it's always going to be people behind all, behind all of it. So if heteronymous labor is not redistributed, there's always going to be some motherfucker who doesn't have to clean up after him or herself. So anyway, this example is even more suggestive for its non-economic implications than for its, ec wait, should we read the, uh, the footnote on that? Because he had said that the, the cost of domestic payments would be so high as to exceed the capacities of even the most opulent society. It's so it's just it's, calling out uh, calling. historic information. But I mean, it it's changed since when this was written. Um, but he's just saying like, yeah, it would be insane to think you could afford to pay people enough money. Like it, it is just a new form of it's enslavement with added gaslighting at that point. Yeah. This example is even more suggestive for its non-economic non implications than for its economic significance. If the activities performed by women without any financial reward were to be given a wage, they would either not be done at all or would be done very differently. Yeah, if you want to know how differently they are done, read Nickel and Dimed when Barbara Ehrenreich talks all about being a part of a cleaning service. All the aspects of, of spontaneous offering, effective involvement, and scrupulous care would not only become priceless, but could never, in fact, be expected of a male or female wage worker whose main concern was to exchange a certain number of working hours for market goods and services of an equivalent value. Besides, the search for higher productivity would lead to the standardization and industrialization of such activities, particularly those involving the feeding, minding, raising, and educating of children. The last enclave of individual or communal autonomy would disappear. Socialization, commodification, and pre-programming would be extended to the last vestiges of self-determined and self-regulated life. The industrialization through home computers of physical and psychical care and hygiene Children's education, cooking, or sexual technique is precisely designed to generate capitalist profits from activities still left to individual fantasy. It is leading towards that social trivialization of the most intimate areas of individual behavior, which Jacques Attali has described as the society of self-supervision. I love Jacques Attali. Everything he's ever cited him talking about is amazing. Uh, I don't think there's any English translations of anything he's done, which is just like goes to show the degree to which there is no gore studies in the United States. Because if, a, if there was enough people who gave a shit about gores, then there would also be people who gave a shit about Jacques Attali because he's constantly being referenced by gores and everything we've read by gores, which this is only the second thing we've read by gores, but you know, the computerized socialization of autonomous activities runs directly against the aspirations at work in post-industrial society. Instead of, instead of enlarging the sphere of individual autonomy, it can only subordinate the activities constituting the sphere to the productivist criteria of profitability, speed, and conformity to the norm. 
at the very moment when the reduction in socially necessary labor time is increasing free time and the possibilities for individual fulfillment in non-economic activity, computerized socialization seeks to reduce this time. Its development implies the liberation of individuals from their freely chosen activities in order to reduce them, even in the domestic field, to passive users of commodity objects, information, and programs. People who just get Amazon deliveries all day and sometimes work and sometimes don't. The women's movement enters the logic of capital when it seeks to free women from non-economically oriented activities by defining these as servile, subordinate tasks, which need to be abolished. They are servile and subordinate, however, only to the extent that economically oriented activities remain dominant and endowed with noble status both in society and in the household community itself. Like if, oh, yeah, the man does the noble work and the woman, she just stays. Yeah, of course, of course. But that's what you critique. Stop making work noble. That's, it's workerism. Workerism makes this sort of feminist reaction. This dominance is precisely what is being called into question. Only, only insofar as the women's movement deepens that challenge, asserting the centrality of non-economic values and autonomous activities and the subordination of economic values and activities, will it become a dynamic component? Sorry, I'm going to reread this. Only insofar as the women's movement deepens the that challenge, asserting the centrality of non-economic values and autonomous activities and the subordination of economic values and activities will it become a dynamic component of the most of the post-industrial revolution and in many respects its vanguard from the perspective from this perspective its main concern can no longer be that of liberating women from housework but of extending the non-economic rationality of these activities beyond the home it has to win over both men inside and outside the home to subvert the traditional sexual division of labor and to abolish not only the hegemony of the values of virility, but these values themselves, both in relations between the sexes and in society at large. Thus, as Herbert Marcuse has shown, post-industrial socialism, that is communism, will be female or will not exist at all. This implies a cultural revolution which will eliminate the principle of performance the ethic of competition, accumulation, and the rat race at the level of both individual behavior and social relations, replacing them with the supremacy of the values of reciprocity, tenderness, spontaneity, and love of life in all its forms. In this respect, as Elaine Terrain has said, the You're woman's... Muted. The woman's... Oh, I'm back now. Okay. But I'm hearing the speaker. Oh, shit, really? Yeah. In this respect, Alan Terrains has said the women's movement is a movement of liberation not only of women, but of men by women. One of its most basic aspects is its opposition to military and financial models of organization to the power of money and giant organizations. It represents a will to organize one's own life, to form personal relationships, to love and be loved, to have a child. Of all social movements, the woman's movement is the one most able to oppose the growing hold exercised by giant corporations over our daily lives. Only women have preserved those personal qualities which male domination has crushed out of men. Since they have been completely excluded from political and military power, women have succeeded in maintaining a capacity for effective relations from which men have been estranged by the structures of power or have estranged themselves to serve the structures. Thanks to the women's movement, we men have already regained certain rights to express feelings, to get involved with children, and so on. What began as a form of cultural self-defense can become a directly social and political struggle against a world of managers, sub-managers, and employees, and against all aspects of a life wholly devoted to keeping the machine in motion. Thus, Far from being a relic of pre-capitalist society, women's activities and qualities prefigure a post-capitalist and post-industrial society, culture, and civilization. Indeed, in every overdeveloped society, they are already imposing their ethical hegemony in relations between couples. The qualities and values of women are becoming common to men and women, 
particularly, but not exclusively, among the post-industrial proletariat. Taking care of babies is no longer exclusively allocated to women, just as full-time socialized work is no longer the prerogative of a male breadwinner. The ever more frequent permutation of tasks and roles within the extended or nuclear family is abolishing not only sexual but other hierarchies. Wage labor no longer seems more noble or admirable than unpaid, autonomous activity within the extended or nuclear family. People can find greater fulfillment in the latter than in the former. It is also far from true that the increasingly secondary character of wage, labor, and economic goals encourages individuals to accept any type of work or working conditions without a murmur. The opposite is the case. Growing personal fulfillment results in greater demands and growing combativeness rather than resigned indifference. The more people are capable of practical and effective autonomy, the less they are willing to accept hierarchical discipline and the more demanding they become as regards both the quality and the content of the work required of them. The priority task of a post-industrial left must therefore be to extend self-motivated, self-rewarding activity within and above all outside the family and to limit as much as possible all waged or market-based activity carried out on behalf of third parties, even the state. A reduction in work time is a necessary but not a sufficient condition, for it will not help to enlarge the sp sphere of individual autonomy if the resulting free time remains empty leisure time. Filled for better or worse by the programmed distractions of the mass media and the oblivion merchants, and if everyone is thereby driven back into the solitude of their private sphere. More than upon free time, the expansion of the sphere of autonomy depends upon a freely available supply of convivial tools that allow individuals to do or make anything whose aesthetic or use value is enhanced by doing it oneself. Repair and do-it-yourself workshops in blocks of flats, neighborhood centers, or rural, rural communities should enable everyone to make or invent things as they wish. Similarly, libraries, places to make music or movies, free radio and television stations, open spaces for communication, circulation, and exchange, and so on, need to be accessible to everyone. The extraordinary success, particularly in Germany, of Barrow's book, The Alternative in Eastern Europe, is mainly due to the manner in which he has received a dimension of Marxist thought, excuse me, revived a dimension of Marxist thought, ignored in socialist or communist policies and programs, apart, that is, from various dissident Italian groups, running from Il Manifesto to the various autonomist currents. In this dimension, communism is conceived as the extin extinction of political economy and as the measurement of wealth by freely determined possibilities for happiness rather than quantities of exchange value. One of the essential preconditions for a cultural revolutionary economic policy is a theory of development of human individuality, dominated, dominated neither by a fetishism of objective requirements. Oh, it's worthy of, it's, this is a big quote. I don't know who it's by. He doesn't say who it's by, but it's a big quote. Um... Oh, it's the manifesto. The, al the alternative in Eastern Europe. Okay, cool. Uh, one of the essential preconditions for a cultural revolutionary economic policy is a theory of development of human individuality, dominated neither by a fetishism of objective requirements nor by the impressive adaptability of the psyche and daring to make normative assertions. The communist demand, in short, is that the overall production and reproduction of material life should be reshaped in such a way that people be repaid for their work as individuals. If a society so far industrialized that it can fairly reliably satisfy the elementary needs of its members at the level of culture that has been attained, then the planning of the overall process of reproduction must give priority to the all-around development of human beings, to the increase in their positive capacities for happiness. Historical examples show, moreover, that the same or similar results of human development and human happiness are compatible with fairly great differences in the quantity of available products. In no case can the conditions for freedom be measured in dollars or rubles per head. 
What people in the developed countries need is not the extension of their present needs, but rather the opportunity for self-enjoyment in doing, enjoyment in personal relations, concrete life in the broadest sense. The remolding of the process of socialization in this direction will be characterized, first of all, at the, at the economic base, by a systematic restructuring of living labor and accumulation in favor of the conditions helping the unfolding of human subjectivity. Among these conditions are the reestablishment of proportionality between large-scale industrial and small-scale handicraft production. The production of surplus consciousness that is already in train spontaneously must be vigorously pursued in an active way, so as to produce quite intentionally a surplus of education which is so great, both, quant both quantitatively and qualitatively, that it cannot possibly be trapped in the existing structures of work and leisure time, so that the contradictions of these structures come to a head and the revolutionary transformation becomes indispensable. And that, again, is Rudolf Barrow. Uh, was it the something in the Eastern Bloc? The alternative in Eastern Europe. Damn, dude. So, want me to start reading, or do you want to say anything about that? Um, I thought that was the section where he talked about tools. Do you remember where he's talking about tools that produce versus tools that produce more need? Right. Was that's that probably it? this chapter? Okay, I like that part a lot. Yeah, that's Iv Ivan Illich. Yeah, Illich. Yeah, conviviality. I've never read the tools of conviviality. I've read the school in society, but uh, the only person I know who's into Ivan Illich right now is Nina Power. Um, I think she uh, just taught a course on Illich. She's like teaching courses on Illich and Bataille. Mm. Toward, towards a dual society, material necessities and moral exigency. Contrary to what Marx thought, it is impossible that individuals should totally coincide with their social being, or that social being should encompass all the dimensions of individual existence. Individual existence can never be entirely socialized. It involves areas of experience which, being essentially secret, intimate, intimate, unmediated, and incapable of mediation, can never... Oh, it, no, sorry. God damn it. It's intimate. It is intimate. It involves areas of experience which, being essentially secret, intimate, unmediated, unmediated, and incapable of mediation, can never be had in common. There can be no socialization of tenderness, love, creativity, aesthetic pleasure, or ecstasy, suffering, mourning, or anguish. Nor, conversely, any personalization of necessities which derive from the coexistence of individuals in one and the same material field where each individual's behavior is ruled by physical laws. Insofar as they have postulated that individuals exhaustively coincide with their social being and that social being realizes the full wealth of human capacities, the theories, utopian visions, and political practices of socialism have led to a straightforward negation of the individual subject. By negating singularity, subjectivity, doubt, and that area of silence and incommunicability peculiar to effective life, affective life they imply the repression of everything from the lover's wish for solitude to artistic or intellectual creation which remains intractable to universal to universalization or no normalization they have resulted in the persecution and in extreme cases the extermination of people who have resisted the total socialization of individuality or have remained aware of its failure this repressive Inquisition, inquis, inquisitorial, normalizing, and conformist quality is something that socialist morality has had in common with the social moralities of religious communities, Catholic fundamentalism, and military or fascist societies. This has been so because only morality, which takes the universal and the good as a given, deducing from it what individuals must do and be, is bound to be oppressive and dogmatic. The result is an amoralism, 
a passion for order in which, as Hegel remarked, the absolute purpose is that moral action do not take place at all. For no morality is possible unless the subject, individual conscious, conscience, is taken as the point of departure. If conscience is not the determining instance of what I can or must do or be, then morality becomes a function of the requirements of the social order, and everyone is required to be and do what society needs. So I know he's a Sartrean. Yeah, uh, I think he's basically a Sartrean, and that this all makes sense within that. Also makes Emmanuel Levinas a lot more important. Um, it ties in really well with Hannah Arendt. Um, I really like how he is doing this. And he's still calling what he wants communism. Uh, he calls post-industrial socialism communism. I find that really fascinating. I don't know what to think of it because I just – he's been – He's been around for a long time. This did not work in rebranding communism for anybody. There's nobody I've ever met who's a communist who's like draws pilled so, or gores pilled. I mean, and so it's just like he is. Thank you so much. Yeah. My God. Thank you. Oh, my God. Man brought me food. It's literally just olive oil and you're just no leaves. For thank you. Yeah. Can I, is there salt? Oh. Hell yeah. Okay. Thank you. Now you have to pay her. Yeah. And I owe you money now. Thank you. She said, I don't owe her money. Oh, I guess that means that she and I get to keep living in the realm of symbolic exchange. Oh, 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 oh. I think uh, on that. So I think Gore's using the word communism is because. Like he's not he's not trying to do marketing like he is just straight up explaining what he like. He's just explaining all this shit. Um, OK, that's good. Yeah. And like I. I say, com like, I say I'm a communist, but, like, like, I'm not a communist according to other communists. You know, like, I, I'm a communist because I know what I mean when I say it. And, I, right. and it's because I'm not trying to do marketing. Like, if I am going to publicly talk. And you're not going to get, and you're not going to get killed for it. Like, exactly, exactly. Is like yeah. Um, like, publicly, if I'm talking to a libertarian i'm obviously not going to refer to myself as a communist i'm going to refer to myself probably as a fucking libertarian because guess what that works for me too <laughs> like yeah <laughs> um but yeah i don't know if it like i'm sure if he were more um concerned with marketing he would come up with a better word for it um but i actually like that he uses communism that way because it's like yeah me too dude it's like he's post left in every way, shape, and form, except for the idea that he thinks he can re that he can he can say, "Hey, everyone, I understand the spirit of everything you're trying to do, and this is the real deal, and you're all wrong." Yeah, um, which was also how Marx did it. So it's just like, okay, yeah, I, uh, yeah, I, I just. I guess my biggest gripe with communism is that I've not found a representative of it who is Gore's pilled. Right. As a system of material relations, society has laws of functioning the material constraints that are not guaranteed by some pre-established harmony to be in conformity or even compatible with moral exigency. As a system of material relations, society has laws of functioning and material constraints that are not guaranteed by some pre-established harmony to be in conformity or even compatible with moral exigency. Right. Particularly in complex Oh, it's Winston. Particularly in complex industrialized societies where social relations are mediated and structured by large scale structures, socially necessary activities are necessary not to self based responsible individuals, but to a material system that still has the character of a huge machine. The functions or work carried out by a traffic warden, road sweeper, tax inspector, computer operator, postal sorter, or court attendant are determined by the requirements of the social system rather than by ethical rules. Each of these heteronymous activities is the result of external necessity, not of a purpose chosen by the individuals themselves. They are all governed by rigid rules and regulations designed to ensure that individuals function like mere machines so that their actions can be synchronized in such a way as to produce the intended effect. 
The rules, regulations, and laws of a complex society dominated by large-scale structures are the result of technical imperatives. They serve to define technical, not moral behavior. Their purpose and effect is to objectify the action expected of each person, encoding it as something prior and external to the actor. Individuals are held responsible not for the predetermined action itself, but merely for good or bad observation of the rules and regulations. Personal responsibility is thus effectively abolished, or in the case of soldiers, civil servants, and all subordinate functionaries, it is prohibited. Rules are not for discussion. Good, good ex rules are not for discussion. Good executive officers will say, we're just doing our job, or I'm just following orders, which is a way of refusing all personal responsibility for what they do. Every social order, particularly the socialism of scarcity, tends to equate morality with obedience to rules and regulations as if these were ethical injunctions rather than technical means, often provisional and improvised, of ensnaring the operation of a contingent material system. Socialist state morality, like military or technocratic morality, has so far consisted of an injunction that individuals should identify with the heteronymous functions and modes of behavior whose nature is defined by the workings of society as a material system or apparatus. A technical imperative has thus simply replaced all ethical exige exige exigencies. Emergency conditions are put forward to bar any criticism or transformation of the structures. The materiality of the technical relations they determine becomes the measure of how impersonal and social relations must be. In the last analysis, analysis, the foundations of morality are the technical requirements of the social machine, with the state as its chief engineer and the political police as its clergy. One can research this system in vain for an area in which moral agency can be found. It is not present at the level of individual relations, nor at the level of a state order which, though supposed to embody the supreme good, actually is but the workings of mechanisms and apparatuses operating entirely beyond any political, social, or individual will and control. In this totalitarian context, individual consciousness reveals itself sub rosa as the, role, as the sole possible foundation of morality. Moral consciousness always arises through an act of rebellion. The very moment when an individual refuses to obey by stating, I can't, not that. This refusal is the cornerstone of moral exigency. It's cogito. It is a revolt against the realism of objective morality. In the name of a realism of an entirely different order, which asserts as impossible the idea that an individual cannot be the sovereign judge of what should and should not be done. The moment of ethical awareness may be surmised in the question, can I want that? Meaning, can I, in my own name, want that action in both its form and its consequences. Could I, in doing it, say that's what I wanted to do? I answer for it. The specific characteristic of objective morality is that it exempts individuals from asking this type of question. Theirs is not to seek or to doubt. To be assured of the good, all they need to do is obey. The authorities, or history, or the party, or the church will take responsibility. In other words, objective morality does not expect subjectivity from individuals. And with the disappearance of subjectivity, morality itself is bound to disappear since the meaning and value of human ends is no longer posed. The question is no longer whether I can want to do what I am doing, merely whether it's necessary. People always become anti-human in the name of some inescapable necessity. I term alienation the impossibility of willing what one does or of producing acts that can be taken as ends both in their results and in the forms of their accomplishment. An, alien, an alienated individual's reply to the moral question, can I want to do that, will always be, it isn't me, it had to be, there was no other choice, etc., etc. There can be neither morality nor relations informed by morality unless two conditions are fulfilled. First, there must exist a sphere of autonomous activity in which the individual is the sovereign author of actions carried out without remorse to necessity, without recourse to necessity, alibis or excuses. Secondly, 
This sphere must be prevalent rather than subordinate, prevalent rather than subordinate in the process whereby individuals freely produce themselves and the web of their relations with others. Nevertheless, as we shall see, the sphere of autonomy cannot embrace everything. It could only do so if its constituent community, founded upon self-regulating, reciprocal relations, were to cover the whole world. Or, if the world were of the same size as that community and devoid of scarcity, forces hostile to human life and constraints of any kind. Both are impossible. In Marx, the reappropriation of the entire world, as an entity made transparent by and for everyone, was predicated not only upon abundance, but also, as Pierre Ros Rosanvalon has shown, upon the idea of a simple, unmediated, family-like community, coextensive with humanity as a whole. Inversely, neo-utopian visions of retribalization, like the ideal micro-societies dreamt in the late Middle Ages or the Renaissance, presuppose the creation of self-sufficient communities outside the world and history, protected from external corruption by their physical isolation. Either perspective leads to a form of pseudo-moralism which, by seeking to eliminate everything that cannot be produced, planned, and controlled by sovereign individuals themselves, forces them into one of two equally untenable positions. In the one instance, individuals pretend to work by their own free will, realities which in fact are beyond their control and possible self-determination. This is the peculiar characteristic of the communist passion. Alternatively, by willfully ignoring the outside world, individuals abandon all control over the way their ideal community is inserted into and utilized by the dominant social order. This has to be brought into dialogue with Todd McGowan's piece yeah. in Underground Theory. But he's talking about this being a unique sort of pathology in com in, in in a lot of communist spaces or just in, in the in the general tendency of communism. It's also of German idealism itself, right? Oh, freedom is being able to self-restrict. But then there's a bait and switch, self-restrict to the this universal law. Yeah. As opposed to uh freely create right. or cooperate. Yeah. Practical autonomy and heteronomy, the two spheres. Making morality prevail does not necessarily require the suppression of the sphere of heteronomy. It merely requires its subordination to the sphere of autonomy. This in turn will be guaranteed to the extent that all around that all around individual development through autonomous activities and relations becomes the effective goal which social institutions in their irreducible core of heteronymous activities are made to serve. Marx already envisaged that at the end of volume three of Capital, when he described how the sphere of freedom or autonomy would only begin beyond the sphere of necessity or heteronomy that could be reduced but never entirely eliminated by recognizing its inevitability, not by not, but not by denying its existence, Will it be possible to reduce this importance, its importance as much as possible, and as a result, ensure that its logic does not dominate every type of individual activity, right? In fact, the realm of freedom, okay, and so this is a quote probably from that, the end of volume three of Capital. In fact, the realm of freedom actually begins only where labor, which is determined by necessity and mundane considerations, ceases. Thus, in the nature of things, it lies beyond the sphere of actual material production, just as the savage must wrestle with nature to satisfy his wants, to maintain and reproduce life, so must civilized man, and he must do so in all social formations and under all possible modes of production. With his development, this realm of physical necessity expands as a result of his wants, but at the same time, the forces of production which satisfy these needs also develop. Freedom in this field can only consist in socialized man, the associated producers, rationally regulating their interchange with nature, bringing it under their common control, instead of being ruled by it as by the blind forces of nature. And achieving this with the least expenditure of energy and under conditions most favorable to and worthy of their human nature. But it nonetheless remains a realm of necessity, 
beyond it begins that development of human energy, which is an end in itself, the true realm of freedom, which, however, can blossom forth only with this realm of necessity as its basis. The shortening of the working day is its basic prerequisite. This is what I get for not reading to the end of volume three. Fuck, dude. Like, that's like the most useful for time energy theory when related to Marx that I've ever seen. And that's why it's crazy that when Doug Lane is thinking about time energy, he says, well, that's just labor time. It's like Marx is very clear that freedom is the freedom beyond labor time, beyond the time of preoccupation with necessity. It will be apparent that contrary to a widespread misconception, Marx does not equate the reign of liberty with self-management of material production by the associated producers. In fact, he asserts that material production is subject to natural necessities of which the physical laws of large machinery are one, and that at the level of material production, freedom consists merely of being able to work with as much dignity and efficiency as possible for as brief a time as possible. This is the direction in which self-management should point. As for the realm of freedom, it will flourish through the reduction of working time. Excuse me. It will flourish through the reduction of working time and of the effort involved in producing what is necessary. In short, there can only be a twofold solution involving the organization of a discontinuous social space made up of two distinct spheres and a rhythm of life governed by the passage from the one to the other. I think this is a. I've heard people describe Habermas as basically saying that. I haven't read Habermas, Habermas saying that, but I've heard that that's basically what he thinks is that you can have, that, that the real issue with capitalism is how it infiltrates spheres that are not supposed to be market spheres. And there needs to be like a nice boundary between the two. But uh, without all the rest of the stuff Gores does, I don't trust that talk. Yeah. The same type of institution may be found in the work of Ivan Illich. Far from calling for the abolition of industrial work and production, he sets out the case for a synergic relation between the heteronymous and autonomous modes of production, aiming at the utmost expansion of the sphere of autonomy. This may be facilitated by complex tools and advanced technologies, despite the fact that they imply heteronymous work. It would be wrong to reject such developments if, at the same time, they allow everyone access to convivial tools, which can be easily used by anybody, as often or as seldom as desired, for the accomplishment of a purpose chosen by the user. The use of such tools by one person does not restrain another from using them equally. In principle, Illich continues, the distinction between convivi convivial and manipulatory tools is independent of the level of technology of the tool. What has been said of the telephone could be repeated point by point for the ma males or for a typical Mexican market. Each is an institutional arrangement that maximizes liberty, even though in a broader context, it can be used for purposes of manipulation and control. It is possible that not every means of desirable production in a post-industrial society would fit the criteria of conviviality. It is almost certain that in a period of transition from the present to the future, from the present to the future mode of production in certain countries, electricity would not commonly be produced in the backyard. What is fundamental to a convivial society is not the total absence of manipulative institutions and addictive goods and services, but the balance between those tools which create the specific demands they are specialized to satisfy and those complementary, enabling tools which foster self-realization. The first set of tools produces according to abstract plans for men in general. The other set enhances the ability of people to pursue their own goals in their unique way. I've attempted elsewhere to illustrate a dual organization of social space into a heteronymous sphere subordinate to the objectives of the sphere of autonomy. The former assures the programmed and planned production of everything necessary to individual and social life. With the maximum efficiency and the least expenditure of effort and resources. In the latter sphere, individuals autonomously produce non-necessary material and non-material goods and services outside of the market, 
by themselves or in free association with others, and in conformity with their own desires, tastes, or fantasies. With primary needs satisfied, the wealth of society is measured by the variety and abundance of convivial tools permanently available in workshops for everyone's use, in local communities, districts, neighborhood centers, or blocks of flats. It is thus made possible for individuals to move continually between heteronymous, wage-based social labor in the general interest, requiring little time or intense personal involvement, and autonomous activities which carry their end in themselves. This naturally encourages people to become extremely critical and demanding of the nature and finality of socially necessary labor, but it also frees them from the compulsion to seek a social identity or personal fulfillment in this type of heteronymous activity. In other words, the realm of moral exigency is virtually disconnected from that of objective necessities of a material or technical sort. Individuals are free to sell their socially necessary labor as a clearly demarcated external necessity, taking but a marginal portion of their lives. They also, however, are free to seek personal fulfillment in and through socialized labor, and nothing prevents them from attaching equal importance to their socially determined and their autonomous activities, from striking a balance that is all the happier to the extent that the qualitative difference between the two is more marked. One could envisage such alternation over daily, weekly, seasonal, or annual cycles, or according to the needs of different kinds of periods of life. This dual conception of society is now the only realistic and practicable solution. For although necessary production time may be very considerably reduced for each individual, it is not possible to make every type of socially necessary labor enjoyable or enriching for those called upon to carry it out. It is possible to enlarge the non-market field of autonomous, self-managed, and self-motivated activity, encouraging auto-centered production and training, and replacing some of the services currently supplied by commercial organizations or bureaucratic administrations with mutual aid, cooperation, and sharing. Yet it is not possible to self-manage the entire social process of production, nor even the large-scale technical units which make it up. There are a number of reasons for this latter fact. Most crucially, the socialization of production and of the productive forces has inevitably led to a decline of the old individual trades and the appearance of more narrowly specialized social skills. This process is irreversible. It has been accelerated rather than slowed down by automation. It is true that technical self-management of the labor process at the level of workshops, assembly units, offices, or building sites make it possible to improve the conditions, forms, and relations of work. It may ensure that work is no longer crippling, exhausting, and brutalizing. It can give workers the power to regulate their own work rhythm and to choose between such vari variables as the duration, intensity, complexity, and relative interest of work. The most exhausting tasks are not necessarily the most complex or the most time-consuming. A technical self-management will never allow individuals to find complete involvement and satisfaction in every type of socially determined activity. It is unable to halt the trend toward the abolition of old skills in the sphere of social production. The old trades were often much more than an art than a transmissible social skill. The know-how of master crafts workers was a personal capacity developed during a lifetime in a trade. The craft was something that each crafts worker kept improving. Learning and progress never come to an end. New skills were acquired and tools perfected. Since a lifetime was needed to learn a trade, each individual had to reinvent it on the basis of existing technology, so that the skills in question were never entirely codified or transmissible. Social skills, on the other hand, involve the acquisition of given amounts of socialized and standardized knowledge. Such knowledge, which almost anyone can acquire in a period in a certain period of time is in principle common to all workers in a particular occupation. <clears throat> Apart from a few impon imponderables, their performances are therefore equivalent and interchangeable. Being in principle wholly communicated through instruction, such knowledge can never be the same as the specific autonomous self-improving know-how of the traditional crafts worker. Social skills do not therefore really belong to particular individuals. 
they are predetermined and limited both in their scope and their nature. Instead of belonging to individual members of a trade, they are the means by which people accede to membership of an economic and social system whose technological development and division of labor remain outside their control. In other words, <clears throat> a trade no longer has any use value for the individuals practicing it. Largely external to them, it is fundamentally nothing more than their mode of insertion into the heteronymous system of giant scientific, technological, or administrative structures whose complexity surpasses any one person's understanding. These can only function through the synchronization of a mass of fragmented and complementary cap capaci capacities programmed for a result that transcends everyone. Social skills, therefore, leave very little scope for development by the individual. Unless one is employed in high-level research or in sectors that still have a craft base, the inability to improve one's tools or to invent new ways of doing things virtually rules out any individual advance in the trade. Instead of growing cumulatively richer, as in the old trades, Social skills generally remain determined by the overall development of stocks of socialized knowledge throughout one's professional life. Development of this kind, usually termed innovation, is only rarely the work of individual subjects or of a creative insight produced by someone in the trade seeking to improve existing tools. Instead, it usually emanates from research departments in which almost everyone is engaged in fragmented work. This is the material basis for what Catherine Liu is getting at in Virtue Hoarders when she talks about the like deprofessionalization of the professions where it's like they've lowered the standards. Like they were like there was a time where the, the PMC was like actually made up of like people who did work their way up through things and stuff like that. Like the original, if you read someone like Frederick Winslow Taylor, he's like a working class dude who worked his way up into that position. Um, it's very different than this kind of fragmented uh, work that is the product of tailorization. The division of labor is thus in it. Inev and I think, you know, what? because she never gives this kind of treatment, uh, she engages in polemics. She does not do a theoretical treatise. Um, I think it's really easy for people who read her to therefore dismiss what she's doing as cultural in this sort of vague sense, like Ben Burgess uses it. It's like, no, it's it's not, it's that's the level she's engaging with it at. But it keeps getting everybody all twisted because that's not, she has done the reading, at least when it comes to some of these other people who do this research. So she just kind of presupposes it and doesn't have to, unpack it for anybody but it's like if she doesn't unpack it for somebody and then somebody reads her or hears other people who read her then they just take away from it this oh it's this cultural thing right the division of labor is thus inevitably personalizing depersonalizing it turns work into a heteronymous activity confirming self-management to control over the effects of changes and decisions taken at a higher point of the production chain Workers further down the chain can never make any decisive alteration. There can never be effective self-management of a big factory, an, in, an industrial combine, combine, or a bureaucratic department. It will always be defeated by the rigidity of technical constraints and by the number of mediations between the wishes of those at the bottom and the results of the job, study, and methods departments. It is thus impossible to abolish the depersonalization, standardization, and trivialization of socially determined labor without abolishing the division of labor through a return to craft production and the village economy. This is out of the question, and contrary to an opinion widely held among those who have never read him, Illich himself has never suggested it. The division of labor and knowledge into fragmented but complementary technical skills is the only means by which it is possible to accumulate and put to work the huge stocks of knowledge embodied in machines, industrial systems, and processes of every scale and dimension. Nothing can support the belief that convivial tools able to assure the autonomous production of use values can, can or should be supplied by the autonomous sphere of production itself. 
Indeed, the more such tools embody con concentrated masses of complex socialized knowledge in a form to be easily handled by everyone, the more extensive will be the sphere of autonomy. It is impossible to imagine that telephones, video machines, microprocessors, bicycles, or photoelectric cells, all potentially convivial tools that can be put to autonomous purposes, could be produced at the level of a family, a group, or a local community. So Illich is accused of saying that they could be, but he's he doesn't say that. And so if you like the idea of convivial tools, there are a lot that of, of technical tools that can be used convivially, but still have to be produced by the realm of heteronymous labor. The point then is not to abolish heteronymous work, but only to use the goods it supplies and the way in which they are produced in order to enlarge the sphere of autonomy. It will serve that purpose all the better if it supplies the autonomous sphere with the greatest possible number of efficient convivial tools, and if the amount of heteronymous work required of each individual is reduced to a minimum. The existence of a sector of socialized production is thus indispensable for three basic reasons. First, only the socialization of knowledge and of its storage and transmission allows a plentiful supply of technologically advanced tools. Second, the highly productive machinery capable of turning out such tools at low cost, whether they be cathode tubes or ball bearings, is beyond the means of local communities or towns. Third, if the time spent on heteronymous labor is to be reduced to a minimum, then everyone will have to do some work. But everyone can only work efficiently in the sector of heteronymous production if the complex knowledge required for the efficient execution of their tasks is embodied in industrial processes in stored and sophisticated machinery, so that the social skills needed for each activity can be acquired in a short period of time. Only standardized simplification allows the mass of socially necessary labor to be distributed among the population as a whole in such a way that the average working day is reduced to a few hours. The extension of the sphere of autonomy is thus predicated upon a sphere of heteronymous production which, though industrialized, is restricted to socially necessary goods and services that cannot be supplied in an autonomous manner with the same efficacy. Most of the objects in current use will therefore be best produced in long industrial runs, while most non-utilitarian objects will be best produced in the autonomous sphere. Heteronymous production may, for example, supply a limited range of sturdy, functional shoes and clothing with an optimal use value, while an unlimited range of similar goods or corresponding of similar goods corresponding to individual tastes will be produced outside the market in communal workshops. Inversely, only high technology treatment will be provided in the industrialized hospital centers. The ordinary complaints which account for the immense majority of illness will be treated at home with, if necessary, the help of relatives, friends, or neighbors, or horse tranquilizers. This dual organization of social space into a heteronymous sphere made up of socially predetermined and relatively impersonal tasks and an autonomous sphere in which anything goes must not be thought of as a separation of the one from the other. Each sphere will, in fact, have repercussions on the other. The personal fulfillment, creativity, and shared activity of the autonomous sect sector will stiffen people against the hierarchical division of labor and the production of goods of doubtful utility. Inversely, the socially determined nature of the heteronymous sphere will protect individuals from the pressures and tensions of highly integrated communities, whether formed by the family or by any other type of commune or cooperative association. We shall discuss this point at a greater at greater length in the next, next chapter. What matters here is that the existence of a socialized sector of standard, simplified work will raise individuals above the narrow space of the local community and ensure that it does not drift towards autarky and self-sufficiency. For communal autarky always has an impoverishing effect. The more self-sufficient and numerically limited a community is, the smaller the range of activities and choices it can offer to its members. If it has no opening to an area of exogenous activity, knowledge and production, the community becomes a prison. Exploitation by the family amounts to exploitation of the family. 
Only constantly renewed possibilities for discovery, insight, experiment, and communication can prevent communal life from becoming impoverished and eventually suffocating. Precisely because of its heteronymous nature, socially determined labor provides the space for circulation on which communal life can feed. There is an obvious analogy here to the position of housewives who see work outside the home as a liberation, even if most of the jobs on offer are particularly oppressive and one-sided. All activities are impoverishing when they cannot be alternated with activities drawing upon other mental and physical energies. Heteronymous activity is impoverishing when it is done full-time to the exclusion of all others, and the same is true of autonomous activity. As Guy Esnar has said, no one can be creative for 12 hours a day, 365 days a year. Regular to and froing between activities requiring intense personal involvement and work divested of mental and emotional effort is a source of balance and fulfillment. The impossibility of abolishing heteronymous work is not then a bad thing in itself, provided that no one is forced to spend a lifetime engaged in some unrewarding and monotonous work. Nor should anything prevent socially necessary labor from being an opportunity for festivity, pleasure, and communication. Culture is, after all, no more than the overdetermination of the necessary by the optional and the superfluous, a process which invests the material imperative with the transcendent, transcendent aesthetic sense. Work that is oppressive when carried out all day every day, like sorting the mail, collecting the rubbish, cleaning and repairing, could be no more than a brief interval among so many others if it was distributed among the whole population and therefore took only 15 minutes a day. It could even become a welcome distraction and opportunity for pleasure if, as is already the case with some types of agricultural or forestry work, it were to occupy only a few days a year or a few months in a lifetime. 100% man, I wanna make, I wanna make tracks, <clears throat> I wanna make tracks about this stuff and, and leave them all over Amazon when I'm working there because <clears throat> this is the kind of work that can be fun. It really can be. I am <clears throat> I'm really like inspired by Amazon. I just it 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 can't it could not be a mere change of ownership and a redistribution of wages or wealth. Um it would have to be a reconfiguration of society and its relationship to heteronymous labor and the division of labor vis-a-vis -vis automation. Because, yeah, I would happily work four hours per week or 10 hours per week even at Amazon if I could have the rest of the week and a dignified life with a functioning computer and functioning internet and air conditioning and the ability to buy a few books and a few meals. Come on. Come on. Freedom, Freedom cannot be based. Okay. Oh, okay. Freedom cannot be based upon abolition of socially determined labor nor, as will be argued more fully in the next chapter, upon elimination of external compulsion so as to have each individual perform what is objectively necessary as an, an, as an internalized moral duty. Freedom consists in recognizing that the sphere of necessity imposes certain heteronymous tasks whose technical imperatives have nothing whatsoever to do with morality, and in confining such tasks to a specific social area by means of precise rules. The disjuncture between the sphere of necessity and the sphere of autonomy is an essential condition of the greatest possible expansion of the latter. I don't know why Byung Chul Han doesn't talk about that. I well, don't. It's like he he gets so much that Gores gets in psychopolitics, but Gores has plausible ways forward that aren't just being. Right? It's like Byung Chul Han is really good at diagnosing the situation, but with no eye towards the future outside of like being like he doesn't really engage in it. Like it's it's it is like sort of like this late stage poetic being Heidegger, you know. Chapter nine, the sphere of necessity, the state. The sphere of necessity encompasses two types of heteronymous activity. That that required for the social production of necessities and that required for the functioning of society as a material system. 
The capitalist model of development is characterized by a simultaneous, a simultaneous expansion of both types of activity. As commodity production has become concentrated into larger and larger units and the geographical as well as the social and technical division of labor has grown, so the functioning of the economic apparatus has required a very rapid development of the network of state services, transport, telecommunications, the collection and centralization of information, the training, schooling, and maintenance, healthcare, of the labor force, taxation, police, to name the most obvious. In other words, work linked to the administration and reproduction of social relations has grown more rapidly than work directly linked to material production and has become a precondition of its heightened efficacy. The mechanisms of the productive apparatus require a substantial substructure of administration and public service, the state apparatus, and through its mediation, tend to transform society into a system of externalized relations in which individuals are not the acting subjects, but the acted upon objects. Society is thus corroded to the benefit of the state, as are the range of political options, freedoms, and powers to the benefit of technocratic imperatives. Thus, the reduction of the sphere of necessity cannot merely involve reducing the amount of work required for material production of the necessities of life. It also necessitates a reduction in all the external diseconomies and state-regulated activities needed by direct production. This can only be achieved if the productive apparatus itself and the division of labor to which it gives rise are in turn modified. It has been well established that the technical concentration of production into large-scale units results in diseconomies and social costs which may far outweigh the apparent economies of scale. These latter consist of a higher rate of return or fixed capital, the same amount, say, 1 million pounds, invested in one large unit is supposed to yield a higher volume of production and a larger mass of profits than if it had been invested in a number of small units. But this type of calculation abstracts from the social investment and social costs entailed by the concentration of capital. The construction of transportation systems to supply the factories with raw materials and carry away their output the need to house the labor force and hence to urbanize new areas, a rise in municipal service and administration costs disproportionate to the expansion of the urban area, higher travel costs for the labor force, etc. In addition to these indirect social costs borne by the collectivity as a whole, there are also a number of invisible costs, a disproportionate increase in environmental pollution and degradation, an increase in ill health among the population, the more rigid management and functioning of a large-scale unit of production, which, because of its very high capital cost, calls for the most tightly controlled load factor and amortization schedule. A large unit of production is likely to have to work day and night, thus increasing the physical and nervous strain for its workforce. It will have greater difficulty in adjusting production to qualitative or quantitative variations in consumer requirements and will therefore seek to produce and maintain a constant or growing level of demand for its output. Hence, demand is likely to be subordinated to supply and the needs of the population to the technical and financial imperatives of capital. The result is a commercial strategy designed to produce consumers who match the product on offer and to satisfy every conceivable need through the maximum sale of commodities. This, in turn, tends to set the consumption of energy, raw materials, state-run services, and public amenities at the maximum level. In short, the quest for the lowest direct cost per unit of production and the highest return on capital leads to the highest level of indirect social costs. The total, direct and indirect, cost of centralized production is often higher than that involved in smaller and apparently less efficient units. For all the, oh, you want to take it? For all these reasons, a trend reversal has begun to manifest itself around the, the theme, small is beautiful. Only small or medium-sized units of production can be subordinated to the needs of the population, controlled by it, and brought into line with local goals and resources. 
They alone make it possible to aim for the lowest level of total cost and the most favorable working conditions and environmental effects. They alone lend themselves to workers' management and contribute to the autonomy of regional and local communities. Self-management and the withering away of the state are only possible in a social space in which small units are able to re-establish a direct relation, if not a unity, between producers and consumers, town and country, and the spheres of work and non-work. In short, reduction of the sphere of heteronomy requires decentralization and a certain level of local self-sufficiency. How far is it possible to reduce the sphere of heteronomy or the sphere of the state? Is there not a threshold beyond which the transfer of the state's functions to the local community no longer yields increased autonomy? Is there an advantage, and if so, how much of an advantage, in abolishing the sphere of necessity as a distinct sphere which imposes external rules and obligations in such a way that necessities are assumed and internalized by each community and each individual? Every type of communal experiment has encountered these questions, and most of them have failed because they have been unable to answer them. Thus, libertarian, communal, or or self-management theories always start from the implicit assumption that heteronomy, or external constraints and obligations, is the product not of physical laws governing the material field of individual actions, but only of the way in which such actions are articulated in different types of social organization and cooperation. They always assume that it must be possible to subsume and dissolve the sphere of heteronomy in its autonomous counterpart. They always imagine that the appearance of communities that are manageable on a human scale must make it possible to do without functions which can only be carried out by state agencies external to the local community. Hence, it must be possible to eliminate those tools including public facilities and institutions, which, being too big for communal control and self-management on a human scale, imply a quasi-military hierarchy and division of labor. Large factories and giant amenities such as motorways, dams, rail or telecommunication systems, centralized energy systems, etc. Consequently, it must be possible that production necessities should cease to exist as external constraints and obligations that necessary labor should be devised and allocated so as to be indistinguishable from free, creative, and fulfilling activity, and that it should be an opportunity for festivity and human communication. In short, necessary labor must be capable of arrangement in such a way that the ideal, ethical goal of a freely chosen mode of cooperation and existence is realized in the production of, of life's necessities. There is only one type of community that actually corresponds to such a unity of material necessity and ethical exigency, namely, the various monastic forms from the Cistercians and ashrams through the Neo-Buddhist or Neo-Muslim sects to the rural or Arasanate communes, artisanate communes, the distinctive characteristic of such communities, however, is that necessary labor is not carried out because of its mere necessity or with a view to the realization of its primary end. All activities and relations within a monastic type community are mediated by their religious significance. Work is a particular form of prayer or of communion with a transcendent order. Its primary aim is not to produce what is necessary, but to allow God to be revealed within everyday life. Equally, the members of such communities do not have relations of direct reciprocity or horizontal communication with one another. In their relations of mediated reciprocity, the goal is not to communicate with or give to other individuals, but to to cooperate with all in achieving communion with God. It is of no great importance whether the religious sentiment informing such relationships be Christian, pantheist, Maoist, neo-Buddhist, or animist. What counts is the sanctification of daily activities, so that simple primary ends disappear behind the highly elaborate ritual of performance. In communities of this type, the unity of the spheres of necessity and freedom, heteronomy and autonomy, is achieved much more by symbolic insinuation than by the elimination of external necessities and constraints. These appear to be freely chosen only insofar as each individual member regards them as something other than they are. The most banal types of material production are seen as a form of spiritual exercise, and the necessity of their execution is regarded not as a chore undertaken because it's got to be done, 
but as a work of moral and religious mortification and self-abnegation. In other words, this realm of necessity is not abolished, but sublimated, and in this sublimated form, it continues to govern every moment of communal life, timetables, strict rules and obligations, hierarchy and discipline, division of tasks, the duty of obedience, devotion, and love. I just want to say that that is probably a critique as well of Giorgio Agamben's The Highest Poverty and we'll have to reread this section once we reread The Highest Poverty because I want to double check. I think that this is going to be really relevant to Brian Brian Weeks's research. It's going to be really relevant to what he he's already doing with Agamben, but also what he's doing with Yvonne Illich. So there's a lot here. I want to just like at this point just sit down and read this with Anne, Mikey, Brian, Elton. Like I want to sit down and read this page by page with everybody. It's like I I want this to be a good basis for everybody. It's like I want to know that like some of the main people in that volume that are like in my immediate organic network are on this wavelength and then are able to go from there in whatever direction they want. But I want to at least be like this, this, this fucking matters. I want everyone on board with this. So we've got uh, nine more pages uh, beginning on the next page, nine more pages. So let's just like take turns, do two, 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 like two pages at a time. And uh, we'll be done in a minute. These are inevitable characteristics of a community. Oh, do you want to say anything about, about these last few sections, though, so far? No, I think uh, it just kind of, like, there are so many people. And it's, it, like, ultimately, this is just, like, a, a different flavor of workerism. Um, but there are so many people that kind of internalize this logic of, like, um, oh, I'm getting in touch with, God. I mean, Jesus Christ, when, like when I was cleaning toilets, uh, it became like I ritualized it in a way and it was like, it's, yeah, like I am. And there is something to it. First of all, it is partly true when you do these mundane, mundane tasks, you do um, come into a relation with the world and yourself and, you know, whatever version of divinity you have and all that other stuff that's true. But then it gets expropriated by the logic of the market where it, like all of that spiritual richness that you do experience that's real, that does exist. But like it just gets totally erased by the fact that you're working 60 hours a week, 70 hours a week. You have no time for, for anything else. You have no time to actually like benefit from whatever meditative activity you were doing and it just be like you like we are turning ourselves into dumb robots or rather we have been turned into dumb robots by capital um and then we make up all these like post hoc stories after the fact to justify it because on some level we all do recognize it for the most part you're muted these are inevitable characteristics of a community in which the necessities of communal life have to be um, assumed and internalized by each individual, since each individual is responsible for the survival and cohesion of the community as a whole. No questioning is allowed of the practical necessities and constraints of communal life. For since these necessities are not regulated by an institution distinct from the community itself, opposition would be directed against the community in question and lead to expulsion of the infractor. Thus, the cohesion of the community is based upon the internalization of practical, of practical constraints as ethical duties and the prohibition of revolt or disobedience on pain of exclusion, dishonor, or the withdrawal of love. Individual goals and collective duties, personal life, and group interests are merged into one so that the love of each member of the community for all the others and not for each other become the prime duty. It is invoked that right there, not love of each other, but love of all others. It's like this religious fucking sidestepping of actually engaging with other people. And everybody's turning yeah. poly 
And so we don't even have to like mourn the fact that we've lost the capacity for singular love. Because if you're not poly, you're a fascist, apparently. <laughs> it is invoked in recognition of the fact that the united community, personified in the mother or father superior, big brother, or beloved leader, has become the source of each individual's members' life of each individual member's life and identity. Thus, an apparent abolition of external constraints is achieved only by transforming them into internal obligations. The constraints and sanctions of the law are abolished only to give way to the most tyrannical law, the duty to love. In all the aspects, in all of its aspects, the community of work and life merely reproduces the primal group and lies at the core of every communal experiment, namely, the family as it existed when the household was fundamentally a productive unit assuming the subsistence of its members. If the state or the apparatus of the law is understood as a district locus in which the necessities of production and communal life are embodied in external laws and obligations, then any society of micro or micro society that abolishes the state thereby loses all capacity to challenge the material necessities of its own functioning. Oof. Oof. Such societies find themselves inexorably bound to the duty to love. Their members will be obliged through love to obey a spiritual father or communal leader whose genius-like omniscience, enlightened will, innate wisdom, and radiant generosity make him or her an indisputable authority. Through figures such as these, the sphere of necessity is personified and sublimated into an, a subjective will. Material constraints are translated into ethical duties. The objectivity of the law and practical necessity is abolished in favor of personal authority, charismatic power, and tyranny. The specific characteristic of such figures, whether a spiritual father, the head of a productive commune, a charismatic leader, or a benevolent tyrant, is their capacity to demand and obtain submission to necessity as a submission to their own person. The leader enunciates the law, which is also duty. Through the leader's mediation, what has to be done in the interests of group life and survival becomes something expected of each individual, not as the realization of some technical requirement, because it's needed, but rather as a recognition of the leader's authority, an act of allegiance, an expression of love for her or his person. Hagiographies of Hitler or Stalin are inequivocal on this or unequivocal on this point. The leader is someone who, through parental love for the community, takes its operational necessities upon himself or herself and transforms them into personal orders and obligations and ensures that its members are prepared as a mark of their love for him or her to undertake things that they would scarcely contemplate doing for themselves. It is the leader who defines and allocates tasks, praise and blame, rewards and punishments. In the leader's person, the moral law and physical laws, ethical obligations, and material necessities are joined so that it becomes impossible to oppose the one without opposing the other. All criticism becomes subversion, all debate a refusal to obey, or in micro-societies, a refusal to love. A disjunction between the sphere of necessity and the area of autonomy, an objectification of the operational necessities of communal life in the form of laws, prohibitions, and obligations, the existence of a system of law distinct from mere usage and of a state distinct from society, these are the very preconditions of a sphere in which autonomous individuals may freely cooperate for their own ends. Only a disassociation of the spheres of heteronomy and autonomy makes it possible to confine objective necessities and obligations to a clearly circumscribed area, and thus to open up a space for autonomy entirely free of their imperatives. Now, I just want to say, I wonder, actually, if um, if he's really, he's just being descriptive. He's not being prescriptive. He's not actually moralizing about great leaders. So I wonder if, in the same way that the solution cannot come from the working class, but also the solution cannot come from a dictator if, but, but at the same time, it, 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 to a large degree, people who, do, who feel like the non-place, you know, are going to be uh, 
necessary or like at least that they are prefiguring a society in which people do not make this identification with work. I wonder if it will require, I wonder if you would agree that it could require a bit of everybody, including great leaders um, in the realm of heteronomy to separate the realm of heteronomy from autonomy. Like, mm. I, I don't, like, I, 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 on one side, I think he might say no, but I, he could just as easily say, yeah, like, like if a past communist great leader had had this theory and had actually understood it and tried to operationalize it, could that have actually made a difference if enough people like got the memo? I don't know. I don't know what he thinks. Yeah, I don't know. It's going to take. He's not against violence. Right. You know. Right. This is as true of large societies as of micro societies based on communal life and production. The only type of commune that manages to survive is one in which the sphere of necessity, that is the mass of necessary work and obligations, has been clearly defined, codified, and programmed. This objective definition of what is necessarily required of each individual is the only means of separating the time allocated to necessary labor from that available for freely chosen activities. Only such a distinction allows for everyone to know when their relations with others are objectively determined by material necessity, the need to collect the rubbish, oil machines, keep to the railway timetable, pick the fruit before the frost, etc., and when they derive from an autonomous subjective choice. Only the latter category of relations is the province of moral judgment and ethics, since morality knows no necessity and necessity no morality. The objectification of a set of obligations external to each individual, yet common to them all, is the only means of protecting the members of the community from the personal power of a leader, with all its associated emotional blackmail and arbitrary behavior. The existence of a state separate from civil society, able both to codify objective necessities in the form of law and to assure its implementation, is thus the essential prerequisite to the autonomy of civil society and the emergence of an area outside the sphere of heteronomy in which a variety of modes of production, modes of life, and forms of cooperation can be experimented with according to individual desires. As the site at which the law is formulated and the material imperatives of the social system are translated into universally applicable objective rules known to everyone, the state serves to free civil society and its individual members from tasks which they could only undertake at the price of impairing both individual and social relations. Thus, the existence of money and prices makes it possible to avoid the haggling and mutual suspicion that go along with barter and the lack of any system of equivalences. Similarly, the existence of a police whose functions need not be carried out as a full-time career makes it unnecessary for each individual to internalize a whole system of law and order. The existence of a highway code makes it unnecessary to negotiate with other road users at every intersection. The basic function of legal rules is to define forms of conduct which, because they are notoriously predetermined, cannot be imputed personally to those carrying them out. Everyone is well aware of the impersonal, anonymous nature of such conduct and its dependence on externally defined laws, and therefore follows them without claiming personal responsibility or holding others responsible. By observing such predefined patterns, individuals function socially as component parts of a social blah, 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 of a social system which determines their conduct. The act of purchasing and paying for something in a shop is, for example, an anonymous action that in no way involves buyer and seller in personal relations. All codification and regulation of behavior results in the replacement of reciprocal human relations by non-relations, or non-human relations in which individuals function as the component parts of a preset mechanism. Non-relations such as these stem from the internal requirement, inertial requirements of society as a machine, as a trivial system, to use von Forrester's words, as a set of factories, administrations, transport and telecommunications networks, etc. Here, relations between individuals are mediated by relations between things, or are subordinated and even reduced to relations between things. They are, in essence, trivial. 
heteronymous relations. Only trivialization of relations regulating the sphere of necessity can lead to the abolition of the struggle for life, the struggle between individuals and groups to secure life's necessities and or to hoard essential goods. In this sense, socially planned production of what is needed by everyone is a basic prerequisite for the pacification of social relations and the emergence of autonomous human relations. This was seen by Marx. The existence of a centrally planned sector of production and distribution able both to provide the necessities of life for everyone and to define the amount of socially necessary labor required from each individual in order to be free of need makes the sphere of necessity a distinct and clearly circumscribed area in which trivialized technical behavior is the norm. The area of complete autonomy lies outside this area. Only rigorous delimitation of the centrally planned, trivialized sphere makes it possible to establish a sphere of the fullest autonomy, in which individuals are free to associate according to their desires in order to create what is beyond necessity. If social planning is extended to all activities and transactions, the sphere of autonomy is negated and asphyxiated. But if, through the absence of centralized social planning, production, and distribution, are left to follow the interest of those in possession of the means of production and distribution, then inequality and the fear of scarcity ensure that the struggle for both necessities and non-necessities continues to mark social relations. Society continues to be divided into an entirely dependent class and a class whose control of the means of production and exchange guarantees its domination of the entire society. Failure to trivialize the sphere of necessity through regionally and locally inflict inflected Central planning does not therefore imply an increase of autonomy, but an increase of domination and heteronomy. Inversely, failure to limit social trivialization to the sphere of necessity replaces the domination of a class with the general domination of an apparatus. This is why economic liberalism gives rise to demands for state control, and why state control provokes demands for liberalization. The point, however, is not to choose one or the other, but to define the field in which both can be cogently put into effect. The field of liberalism cannot comprise socially necessary activities, nor can the field of social trivialization embrace socially non-necessary activity. The creation of superfluities and the production of necessities cannot be subject to the same social rules. The problem facing a post-industrial socialism is therefore the, aboli the abolition not of the state but of domination. Law and domination. The state apparatus and the apparatus of domination need to be dissociated from one another. Until now, however, they have always been confused. The state structures are not, in fact, the source of every type of domination, nor its most fundamental cause. They are called into being by social relations of domination, the domination of one class over society as a whole, which they themselves extend and consolidate by adding their distinctive domination effects. The domination of society by the state is as much a result of as a precondition of its domination by technical and economic concentrations of capital. The large capitalist systems, factories and warehouses, office blocks, and big stores, etc., create a demand for public services, and that in turn gives rise to giant state apparatuses whose own mechanisms reinforce the power of capitalist domination. Society is thus crushed under the weight of administrative machines, with their own physical laws and inert imperatives. In that way, the sphere of heteronomy comes to encompass social life as a whole. The reduction of this sphere cannot just be a matter of reducing the state's sphere of influence. The highest priority cannot be accorded to denationalization, the transfer of public services to the private sector, financial cutbacks, and so on. If the sphere of heteronomy is to be reduced together with the state and its agencies, there must be a simultaneous reduction in every other instrument or apparatus by which, by virtue of its size, has become a means of domination. The state, however, remains the indispensable tool of this double reduction. It alone is capable of protecting society against the domination of giant tools. It alone is capable of ensuring that the means of producing necessities are not monopolized by a social class for the purposes of domination. Its capacity for coordination and centralized regulation makes it the sole agency able to reduce socially necessary labor time to a minimum. It is, finally, 
the only agency able to reduce its own power and influence in favor of an enlarged sphere of autonomy. It goes without saying that the state will do none of that on its own initiative. It is a tool indispensable for coordination and regulation, for the limitation of other tools, and for the trivialization of socially necessary tasks and behavior. But it will only produce these results if it is organized with these results in mind by a society able to use it both to change itself and to serve its own ends. The transformation of the state is one prerequisite for the transformation of society. It is not, however, the priority to which all other changes should be subordinated. The state can only cease to be an apparatus of domination over society and become an instrument enabling society to exercise power over itself with a view to its own restructuring if society is already permeated by social struggles that open up areas of autonomy, keeping both the dominant class and the power of the state apparatus in check. The establishment of new types of social, relation, of, of social relations, new ways of producing, associating, working, and consuming is a fundamental precondition of any political transformation. The dynamic of social struggles is the lever by which society can act upon itself and establish a range of freedoms, a new state, and a new system of law. Only the movement itself, through its own practice, can create and extend the sphere of autonomy in which new freedoms will be born. The movement cannot, however, just through its own practice, found a new state and legal system. It can tear apart and recast the fabric of the old system of social relations, and it alone is capable of doing so. But it does not have the vocation or the means to reorganize society and to ensure that the system materially functions in such a way that the re resultant sphere of heteronomy occupies the least possible space. Unless a number of tasks are fulfilled, the goals of the movement, by the way, this is killing me. Sitting, sitting on the floor is hurting. Like, I didn't realize how crazy this would be, but I need a desk and a chair. This is fucking bullshit. Ugh, two more days of hub events like this. We've been going to be gnarly, day. dude. Yeah, it's going to be sick. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Unless the number of tasks are fulfilled, the goals of the movement cannot find practical expression at the level of society as a whole, nor result in the constant restructuring of social organization. These tasks are to limit and codify the sphere of necessity and hence to define the attributes of the state to draw up the guidelines and instruments of a central planning system and to weigh up the various proper priorities and constraints attaching to otherwise equivalent choices. These tasks can be neither entrusted to the state nor undertaken by the movement. They represent the specific domain of politics. Politics is the site of tension and always conflictual mediation between, on the one hand, the enlargement of the sphere of autonomy impelled by the demands of the movement flowing through civil society, and on the other hand, the state-regulated necessities arising from the workings of society as a material system. Paul, that's a really interesting take on politics that I like a lot. Politics is the site of tension and always conflictual mediation between the enlargement of the sphere of autonomy which is really just impelled by the demands of humans living in society together versus the state regulated necessities arising from the workings of society as a material system. Politics is the specific site at which society becomes conscious of its own production as a complex process and seeks both to master the results of that process and to bring its constraints under control. This is why the function of the political cannot be exercised unless it is distinct from both the state and the aspirations rising from civil society. It can only function as the site of mediation, reflection, and trade-off between the demands for autonomy and the imperatives of technicity between subjectivity and objective constraints. If it is successful in avoiding identification with either of the two poles between which it is located. It can only function as the site of mediation 
if it is successful in avoiding identification with either of the poles between which it is located. So if politics takes the side of the state, then it looks like conservatism, it looks like standard neoliberalism, it looks like commun, you know, like what actually existing communism has looked like uh, in the world. Um, but if it takes or but if it takes the side of autonomy, then it's libertarianism, it's anarchism, whatever. But if politics takes the side of one of these two things, it has uh it it forecloses the possibility of actually doing what it can do and that only it can do if we care about freedom if we care about time energy if we care about anything if you care about autonomy or if you care about law then you have to understand that politics is about the mediation between those things not taking the side of one of those and then just playing fucking horseshoe theory forever that's interesting the political should, on the contrary, be the area of maximum tension where the debate never where the where the debate over ends their condition and possibility and the paths that lead to them is always open and explicit. Thus, the essential purpose of politics is not the exercise of power. On the contrary, its function is to delimit, orient, and codify the actions of government, to designate the ends and means they should use, and to ensure that they do not stray from their mission. Any confusion between politics and power, or better, or between political struggle and the struggle for power, that is, for the right to run the state, signifies the death of politics. For instead of being the mediation between the movement actively at work within civil society and the management of society as a system, politics then becomes the site of one-way mediation, merely transmitting the technical requirements management to civil society and channeling any flicker of a movement into the paths already opened by the state. Mm. Good. In this case, political parties, whether in opposition or in government, become the transmission belts of the state power they exercise or hope to exercise. Instead of questioning the technical necessities, which with aspirations to autonomy and vice versa, they combat, repress, or absorb and neutralize autonomous movements, complicating or threatening to complicate the exercise of state power. In doing so, however, they dig their own graves, for politics can only exist as a distinct space and a political party as a distinct force if society is permeated by autonomous movements, aspirations, struggles, desires, and oppositions, which form a barrier to total state management and continually appropriate new areas of autonomy. If parties cut themselves off from autonomous movements, they become no more than electoral machines singing the praises of their respective candidates for technocratic power, that is, for state management of the sphere of necessity, which will also then try to come into the spaces of autonomy. Once abandoned by political parties, the site of the political tends to move elsewhere. Throughout the capitalist West, we can see a process similar to that which has already occurred in the United States. There, fundamental debates over the production and transformation of society have shifted to clubs, churches, universities, associations, and movements whose aim is not to exercise state power over society, but to extricate the latter from the former in order to enlarge the area of autonomy and self-determination, which is also the sphere of ethical relations. Yes. Just as the belief in progress through scientific, technological, and industrial development has died away, so too has the positivist outlook, which equates the state with the supreme good and politics with, re with, with religion or even morality. We know now that there is no good government, good state, or good form of power, and that society can never be good in its own organization, but only by virtue of the space for self-organization, autonomy, cooperation, and voluntary exchange, which that organization offers to individuals. The beginning of wisdom lies in the recognition that there are contradictions whose permanent tension has to be lived and which one should never try to resolve. The reality is made up of distinct levels which have to be acknowledged in their specificity and never reduced to an average. That necessity knows no morality and morality no necessity. That the physical laws governing the workings of systems can never be translated into ethical rules, 
nor ethical rules into physical laws, that there is no system able to free us despite ourselves to make us happy or moral behind our backs. For happiness, like morality, always consists in being able to realize freely chosen ends and to take as ends the actions that one realizes. I was going to say this until the end, but I, I want to let his final paragraph hit on its own without me quilting it with this. I just want to say as a quick aside that like, I don't think Sartre does this, but maybe he does. But if this is actually Sartre, then I, I like Sartre a lot more than I thought. But I also think that this is just Gores taking what, what Sartre was trying to do and then actually finishing it, which is, you know, the explicit theorization of the, this is the difference between morality and necessity, between an international communist movement and individual morality. Like, this is... This was the contradiction Sartre was trying to think through. It seems like Gore found a way of saying it that I haven't found anyone else saying. Politics is not morality, just as morality is not politics. Politics is a site at which moral exigencies confront external necessities. This confrontation will last for as long as, in Hegel's phrase, consciousness does not encounter the world as a garden laid out for its benefit. Only the permanence and openness of this confrontation can ensure that the sphere of necessity is as small and the sphere of autonomy as large as possible. And that's, that's it. Uh, we would read the other, the other part right, right now, it's that seven pages, um, but, but I, I gotta go to bed soon, and, and, and we gotta wake up early, and we gotta rush into the Dale Tut tomorrow. tomorrow. Uh, if, if we, we have time, time to read those seven pages before the Tut thing, thing, then I'd, I'd be down, down. But, but I also, I also don't, don't want to have to send an alarm that early or whatever, so just text, text me when you're actually up. up. And I might do my last seven before Tut, I might do the last seven after Tut. The other way we're going to get it done, get these all, all sewn together so there'll be three parts from three different times a day, um, from two different days. And we will export as a single thing, be able to release to a handful of people who give a fuck about actually knowing what's up. And uh, to everybody who's like been with us this far, um, thank you for making it this far, except that. I don't, I don't think, think it's like a thank you thing. I think it's like a badass. Like, you're badass. badass. You're doing it. Um, and, and I, I hope you're excited, excited about this as we are. Anything you, you want to say in closing on this? No. <laughs> <laughs>